alchemy being forbidden knowledge, the tablets were condemned for thousands of years by the Egyptian priesthood. When Atlantis sunk into the ocean, Thoth formed a colony in the land of Chem, or as we call it today, Egypt, where he built the Great Pyramid of Giza, which he used to store records of Atlantis. Thoth was eventually called back into the realm of the gods, but before he left, he sealed his records up inside the pyramid and assigned guards to protect it. The descendants of the guards appointed by Thoth eventually became the pyramid priests of ancient Egypt. Around 1300 BC, the pyramid priests brought the tablets to modern-day Yucatan, where he found the Mayans and settled with them. Years later, the Spaniards would conquer South America and the plates would be forgotten. In 1925, a man named Ariel allegedly recovered the plates and translated them into English through the Brotherhood of Life. Doriel's translation can now be found on the internet, which is published with a preface by the author. It reads as follows. The history of the tablets is strange and beyond the belief of modern scientists. Their antiquity is stupendous, dating back some 36,000 years before Christ. The writer is Thoth, an Atlantean priest king who founded a colony in ancient Egypt after the sinking of the mother country. He was the builder of the Great Pyramid of Giza, erroneously attributed to Shias. In it, he incorporated his knowledge of the ancient wisdom and also securely secreted records and instruments of the ancient Atlantis. For some 16,000 years, he ruled the ancient race of Egypt from approximately 50,000 BC to 36,000 BC. At that time, the ancient barbarous race among which he and his followers had settled had been raised into a high degree of civilization. Thoth was an immortal, that is, he had conquered death, passing only when he willed, and even then not through death. His vast wisdom made him ruler over the various Atlantean colonies, including the ones in South and Central America. When the time came for him to leave Egypt, he created the Great Pyramid over the entrance of the Great Halls of Amenti, placed in it his records, and appointed guards for his secrets, from among the highest of his people. In later times, the descendants of these guards became the pyramid priests, by which Thoth was defined as a god of wisdom, the recorder, and by those in the Age of Darkness, which followed his passing. In legend, the halls of Amenti became the underworld, the halls of the gods, where the soul passed after death for judgment. During the later ages, the ego of Thoth passed into the bodies of men, in the manner described in the tablets. As such, he incarcerated, he incarnated three times, and his last being known as Hermes, the thrice born. In the world of the lost soul, the more we know, the more we want to keep him. At a critical point in the lost symbol, a prominent character's life hangs in the balance. To save himself, he asks a stranger, is there no help for the widow's son? The phrase is really a secret Masonic distress signal. The book is referencing an actual ceremonial play performed by only the highest degree Masons. It's rooted in early Masonic lore and is considered the most sacred Masonic ritual. The play features Hiram Abiff, the chief architect of King Solomon's temple who is confronted by a group of thieves. These men threaten to kill Hiram unless he reveals a secret password. Hiram refuses, and then as he is being killed, asks, is there no help for the widow's son? Today, Hiram's courage and fidelity in keeping his word not to reveal the secret is a central tenet to every Mason. In his incarnation, he left the writings known to modern occultists as the Emerald Tablets a later and far lesser exposition of the ancient mysteries. The tablets translated in his work are ten, which are left in the Great Pyramid in the custody of the pyramid priests. The ten are divided into thirteen parts for the sake of convenience. The last two are so great and far-reaching in their import that at present it is forbidden to release them to the world at large. However, in those contained herein are secrets which will prove of inestimable value to serious students. They should read not once but a hundred times, for only thus can the true meaning be revealed. A casual reading will give glimpses of beauty, but more intensive study will open adventures of wisdom to the seeker. 
But now a word as to how these mighty secrets came to be revealed to modern man after being hidden so long. Some 1300 years before Christ, Egypt, the ancient Chem, was in turmoil. The many delegations of priests were sent to other parts of the world. Among these were some of the pyramid priests who carried with them the emerald tablets as a talisman by which they could exercise authority over the less advanced priest craft of races descended from other Atlantean colonies. The tablets were understood from legend to give the bearer authority for its own. The particular group of priests bearing the tablets emigrated to South America where they found a flourishing race, the Mayas who remembered much of the ancient wisdom. Among these, the priests settled and remained. In the 10th century, the Mayas had thoroughly settled the Yucatan and the tablets were placed beneath an altar of one of the great temples of the sun god. After the conquest of the Mayas by the Spaniards, the cities were abandoned and the treasures of the temples were gone. It should be understood that the Great Pyramids of Egypt has been, and still is, a temple of initiation into the mysteries. Jesus, Solomon, Apollonius, and others were initiated there. The writer was instructed to recover and return the Great Pyramid and the ancient tablets. Thus, after adventures which need not be detailed here, was accomplished. Before returning them, he was given permission to translate and retain a copy of the wisdom engraved on the tablets. This was done in 1925, and only now has permission been given for part to be published. It is expected that many will scoff, yet the true student will read between the lines and gain wisdom. If the light is in you, the light which is engraved in the tablets will respond. Now a word as to the material aspect of the tablets. They consist of 12 tablets of emerald green formed from a substance created through alchemical transmutation. They are imperishable, resistant to all elements and substances. In fact, the atomic cellular structure is fixed, no change ever taking place. In this respect, they violate the material law of ionization. Upon them are engraved characters in the ancient Atlantean language, characters which respond to the attuned thought waves, releasing the associated mental vibration in the mind of the reader. The tablets are fastened together with hoops of golden colored alloy suspended from a rod of the same material. So much for the material appearance. The wisdom contained therein is the foundation of the ancient mysteries, and for the one who reads with open mind and open eyes, this wisdom shall be increased a hundredfold. Read. Believe it or not, but read and the vibration found therein will awaken a response in your soul. In cosmic harmony, the real, supreme voice of the brotherhood. Now, they were recorded in legend as the Hermetic text and wise men and alchemists from the medieval pyramids to the present day seeking the wisdom of the universe have longed to discover the originals. Egyptian kings through the centuries longed more than anything else to discover the original wisdom of Thoth. Interesting, huh? The magician... Jiji tells him that the rolls lies in a series of seven boxes watched over by an immortal serpent curled around the outer box. This, in turn, lies in the deepest part of the river Coptus. Anyway, the king was the magician didn't go get the scrolls for him. And anyway, did the kings of this fated dynasty find the lost text? History does not record it, but in their center, in Heliopolis, the seers became the inheritors of wisdom. They passed this knowledge from one generation of kings to the next, including the secrets of how to communicate with the land of the gods and how to maintain that. Isn't that interesting? Because I think this is a lot to do with the fallen angels. They know how to communicate with them and get secret technology. This is why the Egyptians were actually supposedly more evolved than we are, which makes no sense. You cannot reverse evolve. Balance and chaos, as the ancient Egyptians understood the world was identical, kind of like duality. This earth was created as a mound out of the waters of primordial chaos, order out of chaos, just like uh, Albert Pike and all that. Beyond the western horizon lay the other world, a parallel world occupied by spirits of the resurrected dead. Every night the sun left our world to shine in the other world. And uh, basically, as it sank, the spirits of the dead were judged, 
and then they were sent into the other world, a perfect replica of Egypt without its problems. These two worlds were duplicates, definitely um, hinting at duality. It was absolutely vital to maintain these two worlds in balance, or mats, and we're going to come and talk about Matt in a little bit. But first, it says right here, it was weighed against Matt, cosmic balance, uh, what do you call it, karma, and that kind of theory maybe? As above, so below. Now this is a symbol that explains so much about religion and many of the symbols you see in the modern world. Because of the focus on the sun in its various levels of importance and understanding, this symbol was devised in the ancient world to symbolize the passage of the sun through the year. They did the circle with the zodiac, um, zodiac coming from a Greek word meaning animal circle appropriately. They broke the circle into uh, four, the seasons, with the cross, and they put the sun on the cross. I've heard that somewhere before. This is the sun. As far back as 10,000 BC, History is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning someone rise from vision, wealth, and security, saving man from cold, blind, predator-filled darkness and men. Without it, the cultures understood the crops would not grow, the life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of the year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or God, God's son, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the twelve constellations represented places of travel for God's son and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized in his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun of the light, had an enemy known as Set, and Set was the personification of the darkness or the night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was acquired to a child teacher. At the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anak, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. 
Alice of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days, was resurrected. Hello, brothers and sisters. Um, I just wanted to talk about something. Um, I really do think that the uh, fallen angels are here on the earth, and they're playing a big part in the end times. And there's a lot of people who are asleep right now, and they don't realize that, um, that this is happening. Like, for instance, um, you know, like all these false flags, and they have people going in and, you know, committing, like, strange uh, and crazy acts, like, you know, going into a movie theater and shooting it up and, you know, stuff like that. I really do believe that these are, um, these are acts from, like, the fallen angels or their um, offspring. And uh, the Bible does say that the fallen angels came to earth in Genesis 6, and they uh, mated with women. And they had children that were very, very different than, you know, normal children, that they were giants. If you just read Genesis 6, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and also, if you if you read Genesis 6, it does talk about, you know, like, um, a difference in, in how the babies look. Like, for instance, it says um, there were giants in the land, you know, and it talks about their offsprings being giants. And the only way that could, you know, happen is if, some you know like a mixing of some kind of dna and that was what was going on during the flood and also it happened again uh, during solomon gonorrah when when uh, god um you know whenever he uh poured brimstone down on the city well um it also says in the bible that jesus would return when the days are just like the days of noah's days and of the days are like lot's days and you know which was you know lot was during the days of Sodom and, and Gomorrah, I can't say the that correctly. I'm sorry, but um, anyways, um, we are living in those days right now, and those um, beings, these fallen angels and their offspring, you know, they've gotten better at mixing their DNA. Now they can make um, a person probably the you know not as you know like that stands out as much. You know, they may be like the same height as a normal human being. But there will be some differences in them, you know, that will throw, you know, you know, like, um, throw some people off. Like, when you look at them, you'll just be like, well, what's, why does that person look so weird? You know, you would know there's something different, you know. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but, um, like, for instance, the Bible says that the offsprings of, of the fallen angels and, and the uh, humans that were giants, they had six fingers on each hand and six toes on their feet on each foot okay well there's a group of people that have they have uh, six fingers on their on each hand but I don't know if they got six toes on their on each foot you know they didn't go into that you know that detail but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they they do have six toes um, maybe that is one um, you know part of the uh, what is it the DNA that they could not fix you know they probably couldn't fix that but they they maybe they was able to make you know make them shorter and not as tall you know because they've been playing around with dna um you know for a long time if, you know people who, just do some research people who are abducted by aliens you know they think they're these are just aliens from another planet whenever they're demons that are abducting them and um these demons these fallen angels are playing around with human dna you know, and they've been doing it for a long time. If, if you just research, you'll see how many people have been abducted. And then you, if you pay attention to, you know, what these people are saying, it's always about they're taking, like, sperm samples from them or taking eggs from them. And there's even women who report that they um, re were re uh, retaken again or abducted again so they could go back and um, nurse their child that, that they have that's a, um, what do you call it, a hybrid child, like a Nephilim, you know, and some of, some of these people report seeing a room full of kids that look like they're humans, but they're not, you know, and, you know, and also these people are implanted with, uh, like, chips in their bodies, and see, during the, during the end times, um, the uh, Antichrist will also be, um, what do you call it, the rulers of the aliens, if you want to put it that way, but they're the fallen angels. They'll be th this antichrist will be their leader. Okay, so 
this um, these fallen angels are all for the the what is it the new world order they they can't wait to for the new world order to take effect because they are part of it and they will also be introduced into society here soon and they will no longer have to hide who they are but they will they will kind of still kind of hide it because they won't say that you know they're um, fallen angels you know and they're not going to say that they're nephilims and they're not going to say that um, you know they're beings like that because they they, they don't want to prove the Bible to be correct so they're going to call themselves anything but that they're just going to say they're um, an alien life from another planet and people some people are going to fall for that that deception and not realizing that they um, they're mentioned in the Bible and the Bible warns that um, in the end times they will return because they'll be just like the days of Noah's days and the days of Lot's days and you just have to do a lot of uh, what do you call it reading and research to find out what was really going on and you'll see that there is giants in the land and the reason why God had to flood the world was because of these giants and these uh, fallen angels because they were ruining DNA and the only ones that did not ruin their DNA was Noah and his family. They were the only ones that were pure. So that's why they were saved. Everyone else had to get wiped out off, off the planet because their DNA was corrupt. And, you know, we couldn't continue with carrying that DNA, you know, on forward, you know, through history. Because everyone would look probably creepy looking right now. So um, God put it into it. And then God also put... Um, uh, somewhere in the Bible, I can't remember where, but there's something about where they were put a restraint on them, fallen angels, like the, they have like a restraint where they can't, they weren't allowed to affect us humans for a while, and then that re that restraint will be, re you know, loosened, and then loosened and loosened, and then, uh, and then they will eventually, it'll just be like slowly and gradually, you know, they'll just start messing with humans again, to where it's like, like we got an infestation of demons all over the world you know and people are going to be possessed by demons more often than ever you know just like whenever Jesus was walking on the earth you know there was a lot of people who were demonically possessed Jesus healed them well you're we're gonna see that on the streets when we walk down the streets it's already happening there's people who are pulling their clothes off getting naked and jumping on people's cars and attacking people through their sunroof it's happening there's a girl stripped naked almost I think down to her panties and went into McDonald's and was uh, destroying McDonald's you know because she was demonically possessed some people might say well it was drugs well I don't know if it was drugs or not because um, I've seen people who took in drugs before and I've never seen them strip naked and try to bite people's face off or anything like that so you know that's why I think it's it could be a combination though it could be a combination of the drug and being demonically possessed because they say drugs are are the gateway you know if you think about that you know drugs are the gateway to open up your soul for demonic possession because you're opening yourself up for that you know and so maybe that's what's going on and it's happening more and more because we are living in the end times and the de the, the demons are free and they're running or you know looking for whoever they can you know jump into like take you know possess or take over you know like there's some kids that were playing with the widgie board and um this was i think it was here in close to the mexico border or texas i'm not sure but they're playing with the widgie board there's a, a report on it and uh, they became demonically possessed. The, one of the girls was growling like a dog, and um, or growling like a, an animal or some sort. And the other, the other two were like, um, you know, like hallucinating, and they couldn't see or hear anything that was going around them. Well, anyways, what I was trying to say earlier is that the uh, the uh, fallen angels are all for this new world order, and their leader is the Antichrist. And that's why they're all for it. And if you notice that when people are abducted by these aliens, they are implanted with a microchip. Well, whenever the Antichrist comes into power, he's going to force everyone to take a RFID chip or some kind of uh, mark on their right hand or their forehead. We're not real sure 
what kind of mark it will be, but it will be something that will be on your hand or your forehead. And um, he will force everyone to, to accept this mark. Um, and if you do not accept the mark, then um, you are going against... Um, you're going against the government. They're going to call you like a, a a traitor, I guess, or a terrorist because you're going against the government and going against the president or the not president, but the antichrist. And um, so some of these people, some of some people will be killed like instantly and others will be um, put in like concentration camps like they did during Hitler's days or uh, FEMA camps and um you will be, they will try to re-educate you um, to, to make you come to agreement that you will take this mark on your hand or your forehead. And if they can't get you to change your mind, then they're going to line you up in, in this long, long line that's probably going to be for miles long. And you're going to stand in this line for a long time and one at a time and maybe three or four at a time. I don't know how many they'll have going at one time. But they'll start uh, using guillotines to start cutting people's heads off. But whatever you do, do not get out of the line and do not chicken out because Jesus is in control and you won't feel any pain. He will make sure of that, that you don't feel any pain. Um, he will take care of you. And all you, all you have to do is just praise him and glorify him and just put your mind on Jesus during that time and forget about everything else in this world. And just praise and glorify him because that day will be the day that you will be with Jesus Christ in heaven. And um, so don't don't chicken out. Don't run out of the line because you're afraid. Because your flesh will die only. Only your flesh will die. Your soul will go to heaven and you won't feel any pain. But if you but if you chick, chicken out and you run out of line and you tell them that you'll take the mark of the beast because you get afraid. Um, sorry, that was my dog's. Um, if you get afraid and run out of line and they give you that mark of the beast, then when you're in, when you go to hell, because you will go to hell for that, you will feel pain for the rest of your life. You will feel pain. I mean, not for the rest of your life, but you'll feel pain for eternity. And you're running away from pain because you're afraid of the pain that you was going to feel from the guillotines. But in turn, you'll be actually running towards pain because you'll be going to hell. And you'll be feeling pain for eternity. So that's one way you need to look at it. And remember Jesus will be there with you. And he will take the pain away from you. And um, he will protect and protect you from that pain. But you still have to go through the guillotines. If that's what you know what happens. And um, But you will be in heaven with Jesus. And um, you'll get your, your white robes. And um, you know so whatever you do don't chicken out. Don't. Don't take the mark. It's not worth it because, it, you know, eternity of, of hell and living in torment for eternity, you know, that don't sound very fun. And whenever you're in heaven, there won't be any pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more death. There will be, you know, all, the, all everything in heaven will be beautiful. And it will be like the the greatest, I don't know, it's, it, there's no words for it. It will be just so great. And you want to spend eternity there and not in hell. Trust me. Well, anyways, um, I just wanted to share this with y'all. And I wanted to show you these people um, to see what y'all think. And, um, well, uh, that's it for right now. God bless you all. All right, bye-bye. If Brazil takes home another World Cup title in 2014, the De Silvas might be the only family to count all six of its wins on one hand. All the members of this Brazilian family were born with an extra finger on each hand, known as polydactyly. It's a rare genetic condition. But ask any of them and they'll tell you it's more of a blessing than a curse. The techniques I use to play with six fingers, I get from the techniques people use to play with five fingers. It's cool. I'm proud of having six fingers. It's easier to grab things and do other stuff. And that pride never shines more brightly than during this year's World Cup. The local media making them a symbol of hope that Brazil will lock down its sixth World Cup title. Since the last World Cup, we've wanted Brazil to win its sixth championship. 
so we can show with our six fingers the number of times Brazil has won. This year, they'll be on the edge of their seats during each match, keeping all 12 fingers crossed. Robert Bumstead, Associated Press. Hi brothers and sisters, this really is a quick one. Um, I'll probably end up doing more research, but I just wanted to share this as it's fresh for me. The Lord brought to my attention while I was just laying in the bath relaxing, meaning that my head was cleared. And um, the Lord began to inspire in my mind how the Nephilim were called giants in those days. And after doing the video on the two witnesses and the connection between the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, um, <clears throat> now of course this is cir purely circumstantial evidence and it's, it, you need spiritual eyes to see the connections here. Um, but there, it stems to reason that the Nephilim were giants, meaning gigantic in size, because of a wayward relationship between the pineal gland, which was the spiritual, and the pituitary gland. So basically, um, the Nephilim were a hybrid in which Lucifer didn't know how to, or maybe didn't see it coming, but he wasn't, he didn't quite know how to make the synergy between the pituitary and the pineal take place without adverse side effects adverse side, uh, side effect in the case of Nephilim would be giganticism. And we can see the connection medically in that claim um, where some people with a way with pituitary gland or a um, small pituitary tumor can cause giganticism where the human growth hormone doesn't stop producing human growth hormone after the child has grown. So they keep growing, 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 growing throughout their whole life. Um, so I just, you know, I've got to research that. I have to have a look, a look at it more closely. But I thought that is so, um, you know, one of those aha moments, which are, you know, quite rare for me these days. Um, so I thought I'd share that and, you know, open a discussion before I um, do the long hour long video and share that. So this is, I've got a phone call, but... Uh, I just wanted to share that real quick. Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Greater Liberty. Coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story. Hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at and that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Western civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that's going to determine what the future will bring. And I have to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views, and well, for the next hour, they're going to be the views of L.A. Marzulli, and we're going to be talking about... Watcher 6. And that's uh, Lynn's latest book, LA's la latest book. And, and basically, you know, have you ever th thought that uh, if there were really giants in America at one time, that you wouldn't have heard of them? Uh, gi giants were 8 feet tall, 10 feet tall, 12 feet tall, 16 feet tall. How could you conceal something like that? Well, very simply, ladies and gentlemen, your reality is created by the people who control the media, and the people who control the media have an agenda, and there's so much about the history of the, uh, America, the, uh, of our nation, that you will never hear about, and especially the spir spiritual implications of what's going on. L.A., you pick up the story from there. Well, first of all, Dr. Stan, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's been a while, and uh, it's good to be back here again, and of course, I'll see you at the Colorado Springs Conference coming up on the Friday this week, and I think there's like 25 speakers, <clears throat> excuse me, 25 speakers who will be participating in that, and it's uh, it's really going to be a fun 
fun uh, three or four days. So well, you know, that, that, that is the most amazing thing, L.A. Those are some of the finest speakers in the country. And, I mean, people, Chuck Messer will be there and Tom Horn and you and so many of the people of, of regular guests on Radio Liberty are all going to be there. There are going to be over, well over a thousand people in the audience there for a three-day conference. And a lot of people are going to be watching this on television at home as well. I'm amazed that there's this much interest. I'm flattered to be uh, asked to be at one of the speakers. <laughs> and really looking forward to seeing you and the other leaders in this effort to warn people about the spiritual implications of what's coming down the line. But you pick up the story. Thank you so much. Well, um, this all started off with a, a trip to Ohio at a conference about two years ago. And when I was there, uh, my colleague and friend Russ Dizdar, who will also be speaking in Colorado this weekend, said, L.A., do you know where you're going? I said, yeah, I'm going to Newark, Ohio, Russ. And he said, well, no, do you really know where you're going? He said, you buy your computer? And I said, yeah. And he goes, type in uh, Nephilim Chronicles, Fallen Angels in the Ohio Valley. So I did that, kind of like, what the heck? And up comes this book by this author by the name of Fritz Zimmerman. And here I was going to this place, and I had no idea uh, what was actually there thousands of years before the city of Newark, Ohio, was created. And, of course, what I'm talking about specifically is the Great Circle Mountain Octagon Mountain Complex, which was built about 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. And I went there, and my jaw was literally on the ground the entire weekend. I was absolutely taken aback. I got a hold of Fritz Zimmerman. I made another trip back there several months later, and Fritz and I spent um, several days looking at everything and walking the mounds. And he was, I read his book and, 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 and started doing my own digging. Well, you know, I had thought that I had really done everything I was going to do with the Nephilim. And I guess God had other plans, because what I realize now is I barely scratched the surface. With the uh, with the first five books, um, which are worth reading, I'm not I'm not dismissing them, but this book, uh, On the Trail of the Nephilim, has opened up uh, just entirely new vistas for me and frankly for the reader. And what we've what we've what we're trying to do, of course, is nail it down with DNA testing. We've done sun testing, uh, which is actually not in the book, but is mentioned in Watcher Six. I speak, of course, of Raman spectroscopy, and we'll get into that maybe a little bit later. But what, we, what, we've, what we've discovered and what the concept is this, that the Smithsonian Institute and other institutions in academia have attempted at all costs to uphold the Darwinian paradigm, which is sacrosanct to them. Okay, well, I want to hold that thought. We'll yes. be back in just a moment with L.A. Marzulli, one of the most amazing stories you'll ever hear. L.A., you go right ahead. And thank you, Dr. Stan. And what we realized was that um, the remains that were found, and we have article after article after article. Uh, we've had doctors, and you're a doctor, so you, you know, you know, you're an M.D. And what what the what we discover is that these men of letters, a hundred years ago or earlier, look at these skeletons and were absolutely taken aback by what they were saying. We have reports, but the short ones are seven feet. They go all the way up to 12 feet. That's just in the Ohio Valley area and, and other other surrounding areas. But we'll just stick with Ohio because that's that's where we sort of that's where I sort of concentrated the initial part of the study. Um, what we discovered was that these bones and these remains were collected by teams that were sent out from the Smithsonian Institute. This is undisputed. These bones were collected. Uh, they were supposed to be displayed. Of course, they never were. And now the Smithsonian and other so-called archaeologists who hold the Darwinian paradigm uh, refuse or just say, well, those bones uh, really never existed and that these doctors 100 years ago really didn't know how to measure. And I just found that so intellectually dishonest and so disingenuous. And, and I, I, I literally, I had a conversation with an archaeologist, a tenured professor of archaeology at a major university. And I asked he or she, because I'm not going to divulge, you know, whether it was a man or woman, I just keep the person as anonymous as possible. But I asked he or she um, what they thought about men of letters over 100 years ago measuring disarticulated skeletons. And they told me that back then they didn't know how to measure. And I just literally fell out of my chair. And, I, and my rebuttal was, you're trying to tell me that a medical doctor 120, even 130, 40 years ago 
would not know how to measure using using a ruler or a tape a disarticulated or an articulated skeleton. I mean, it's just absolute nonsense. And granted, you know, doctors, let's say during the Civil War, didn't have the medical um, um, accoutrements that we have today. We get that, but they were they were educated men, and surely they knew a giant or a, from a disarticulated skeleton by measuring the femur bone. And, and estimating by the size of the femur bone, which is the thigh bone, how big that person could have been in life. And, I, look, we have report after report after report. We had probably 250 of them. I hired a, a uh, man who goes into the archives and goes back and, and looks at all the old papers, and he sent me approximately 250 articles, all talking about giants between 7 and 12 feet tall, found all throughout the Americas. There's actually some out here in Catalina. Right outside my window, Catalina hold, Island. Hold, nine, that, nine hold, that thought, hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and L.A. is simply saying that uh, when he went to Ohio, why, of course, they found evidence that, that there had been uh, really uh, this race of people living there 3,500 years ago. Now, how do you put that in perspective? Well, that's about the time, certainly, that uh, that basically Moses was actually uh, going into the land of Israel. That was about 1,500 years B.C. That's about 3,500 years ago. Well, certainly there were things here in America at that time, and basically what happened was probably close to 100 years ago, why the Smithsonian Institute sent their agents out to collect these bones of, of the giants, and many of them were up to 12 feet tall, and they were to be put on display, but there's been an organized effort to deceive the public, and basically, of course, these bones of Sydney were never displayed, and now they're denied that they ever were found. And yet, of course, L.A. had actually employed a gentleman who went through the ancient records, old records, uh, written 100, 120, 2,550 years ago, and found over 250 references to these skeletons of these giants that existed here in America uh, 3,500 years ago. So why is there this effort to cover this up? Well, L.A. believes this is, uh, has to do with the Darwin's concept, and it may well be. Or there may be other things, but the important thing is they're lying to the American public about the fact that these giants existed, or that they were here. And, of course, many people believe that these are Nephilim, that these certainly are the offspring of these demonic forces, and perhaps this is the reason that the people from the Smithsonian and other scientific, so-called scientific organizations don't want you to know, because the last thing they would want you to know is there's any validity to the stories in the scriptures. So go right ahead, Ellie. That was a great summation, Dr. Stan, incredible. I'm going to read you just a couple of clippings. Uh, this is from May 31st, 1919. Seymour, Texas, May 30th, oil drillers claim to have found bones of a prehistoric giant 10 feet high. Mexico City, August 17th, 1922. The Department of Agriculture yesterday received from an agent in Tiburon Island, Gulf of California, the skeleton of a primitive man more than 10 feet tall. It was found a few days ago. Other bones of similar size have been encountered. February 2nd, 1909, the skeleton of a prehistoric man of large size has been found in a town 10 miles southeast of the city of Mexico. According to a news received here yesterday, the discovery was made by a peon who went for a skeleton which measured about 15 feet in height. goes from there. September 27, 1924, a dispatch from Casopolis, Missouri, says that an opening amount near Diamond Lake Wednesday, a giant of prehistoric race was unearthed. The bones of the skeleton are well preserved. A lower jaw is immense. An ordinary jawbone fits inside with ease. By measurement, the distance from the top of the skull to the upper end of the thigh bone is five feet five inches. A doctor who was present stated that the man must have been eleven feet tall. And yet, of course, Doctor Stan, when you talk about talk about this to archaeologists, they they fall back on well, these medical doctors in 1920, because that that was um, let me see, that was 1924, so that's less than a hundred years ago. So that doctor did not know how to measure an articulated or a disarticulated skeleton. In other words, here's here's a man that's trained. Um, he, he knows anatomy. That's, that's, and I don't have to tell you this. You know that you know anatomy. You have to. And he estimates this being was 11 feet tall. Well, look, if it was one story, we dismiss it. But there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories like this. Obviously, someone or a group of people are attempting to obfuscate what is really happening 
and keep it from the American public and from people. Why? Very simple reason, because it goes against the Darwinian paradigm and shows that there is a supernatural, as you've mentioned many times, Dr. Stan, on your show, and that supernatural coincides with the biblical narrative that tells us that the fallen angels had sex with the women, the Nephilim were the offspring of that, and as you pointed out, about 3,500 years ago, the diaspora of the Levant, or which is known as the Promised Land, happened when, when Joshua and Caleb pressed into what is known as the Promised Land. There were Nephilim tribes there. There's a mandate that's given from a loving, holy God to wipe them all out. Men, women, children, animals, burn everything. And that does not go really well with, uh, you know, the God of love, does it? So there's something else in operation here. And most biblical scholars can't reconcile that and figure out what is really going on. The moment we plug the Nephilim, the progeny of the fallen angels, everything begins to make sense. And there are over 20 Nephilim tribes in this area. And Dr. Stan, they don't all look alike. That's why there's different tribes. They all have different genetic characteristics. And yet the mandate is to wipe them all out. And there's a reason for that. Again, because these are demonic hybrid creatures which were never supposed to exist, and that's why the finality of a judgment, there's not a shred of grace and mercy, and yet conversely, there's grace and mercy that is shown to Nineveh, and these guys invented the word barbarian. Uh, they would, When you went to Nineveh in the ancient world, you saw a row of stakes around the city, and on every one of those stakes were the deca decapitated head of a victim. They would, they would flay their... Uh, their uh, captives alive and tack the skins up on the wall. These people invented the word barbarian. And yet God sends Jonah to preach to them. Grace and mercy is extended to the people of Nineveh. And they do repent, by the way. But you never, ever, where the Nephilim are there in the flood in Sodom and Gomorrah, in the conquest of Canaan, that olive branch, that, that grace and mercy is never, ever extended to the Nephilim. And so as Joshua and Caleb come into the Promised Land, the tribes begin to migrate in panic. Some of them go north through Europe and wind up in, in the Ohio Valley. Others, and, and Thor Heyerdahl proved this, I got it, it, it's in my book, On the Trail with the Nephilim, they sailed across the Atlantic and wound up in South America. And they began to create what we call, what I call, Nephilim architecture. The architecture, Dr. Stan, that, I, that is in the Ohio Valley, you can only see it from the air, and it is done with mathematical precision. Also, there was human sacrifice found on that site that was on Earth on that site. Native Americans, uh, when asked, did, did you create these, they denied it. Go back when, when the white men first started. It was there. When, when they came into the land, these, these sites were already there. No, no, let me repeat that. Basically, L.A. is saying, look, when the, when the, when the Indian, Indians came, the American Indians came into this area, the sites were already there. In other words, they came in after the Nephilim had been there and it had died out. But the Nephilim were there, these giants, and basically, how could you conceal something like that? Well, basically, if you read uh, L.A.'s book, and uh, it's called Watch Your Sick, We Carry It, we think it's an important book, there uh, Actually, a reproduction of page after page after page of newspaper articles, uh, you know, from a hundred years ago, and all talking about these giants that have been found. But you're never going to see this mentioned in textbooks. You're never going to see this discussed on university campuses, because university campuses are dedicated to one thing: that's destroying faith in God and convincing people that evolution is a reality. And certainly, the idea that man was created or there's a spiritual battle going on that has to be totally suppressed and boy do they do a good job of it because the average student can come out of university and have no idea about the truth of what's going on in fact it took me a decade or more to unlearn all the things i had been conditioned to believe when I was certainly in college but go right ahead well the, 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 yeah, let, me, let me pick it up from there because it, it gets even better what we find Dr. Stan is that these, these giants were everywhere in the Americas I actually spoke uh, to a, uh, a full-blooded Native American First Nation person, Robert Mirabal. <clears throat> and when I saw his, his pageant, this guy's a Grammy Award-winning musician, and he has a, a troop of, of musicians and actors that travel with him, and they reenact these stories <clears throat> that have been passed down orally from grandson to, or from grandfather or great-great-great-great-grandfather, down it goes. <clears throat> these stories go back hundreds and hundreds of years. 
And so I'm watching this. Someone sent me the link, and I'm watching this thing by Robert Mirabal. And he starts off, and he basically says, and I, I write this in the book, Amateur with the Nephilim Verbatim, a long time ago, the people from the sky came and saw the daughters of men and women, and, and they had union with them, and sons and daughters were born to them, and giants were in the land. Dr. Stan, it mirrors our Genesis 6 account almost verbatim. And when I called Robert and I said, where did you get this story? He said his grandfather told it to him. Well, where did he get it? His grandfather told it to him, and back and back and back it goes. It's the oral tradition. I was just in, and this will be in volume two, uh, several months back I was in uh, Navajo country, and I sat down with a, a woman who heard the same kind of a story through her grandmother, oral tradition, about the giants in Milan. It's there. It's there. It's not fantasy. It's not, you know, superstition. It's funny, when you talk to the archaeologists about this, and not all of them, I'm sort of painting with a broad brush, but, oh, well, that's superstition. We can't, we can't uh, discount that. And yet, when you say, wait a minute, you know, the American Indians say they didn't build the Great Circle Mound or the Octagon Mound. These people didn't, didn't have math mathematics, which, which is needed to build these structures. They didn't have this stuff. Well, you're a racist by saying that. And yet you're not a racist when you point out, hey, the oral tradition is supporting that they're giants in the land. Then these same archaeologists will turn, flip the tables and go, you're a racist because you believe that they didn't build the mounds, but they're not a racist by saying that the oral tradition doesn't, doesn't hold water. It's like, what? You know, once again, falling out of my chair. And speaking with Robert Mirabal and talking to this Navajo uh, elderist at, at the Navajo Indian Reservation, Something is going on that, that goes back about 3,000 years. And what it does is it, it bolsters the biblical worldview, Dr. Stan. And we, we, from there, we went to Peru. I'm kind of jumping here a little bit. But all this is sealed up like a drum, literally. It's tight in the United States. You can't see anything. Now, recently, I've, I've had, um, and this will be in Volume 2, I've had two doors that have opened for me. I'll be traveling to a, an undisclosed a site where I'll be looking at a journal from the 1920s where a particular person apparently unearthed nine to ten footers. The journal has never been seen by anyone. It's held in a museum. No one has photographed it. No one has read through it, best of my knowledge. I'll also be flying to another state in the Midwest where I've been, I've been granted access into the archives to explore a, a dig that happened in the 20s where, once again, nine to ten footers were unearthed. And apparently there were pictures, but who knows? Most of this stuff has been sanitized. When I was down at UCLA several months back to look at the collection um, of, of, of supposedly artifacts that were dug out from a site in Southern California, it was sanitized. Part of the collection is England. The other part is in France. And what I got to look at here was strictly Native American. So everything here is under lock and key. The American public never sees doodly squat as to what's going on. But here's where Hold the thought. Hold the thought. <laughs> Go right ahead, Ellie. Here's where it gets interesting. When I was at the Field Museum in Chicago, and we're, we're walking through the American Native American First Nation uh, exhibit, and there's this very large spearhead, and this spearhead is really, really big, and a five foot six Native American is not going to be throwing this thing around. So what, what it says on the little placard underneath it, this spearhead is ceremonial. Well, well it says who is ceremonial? How do these people know and get this, Dr. Stan? This is taken from the so-called Hopi. This is how absurd it gets. The spearhead is found in the mound builders of the Hopi culture. Well, Hopewell was a farmer. So, this, first of all, these people were never called the Hopewell. But that's okay. That's the name that they gave them. No one knows where these people went to, where they came from, what their civilization was. And yet they make these, these ridiculous statements, in my opinion, like, well, this spear was ceremonial. Why don't you tell us and, and, and be honest about it? And I tried to find this out, got nowhere. Where did this spear originate from? Was it in a mound? And if it was in a mound, was it next to a skeleton? And if it was next to a skeleton, how big was this guy? We have, and, and what I did right after that, we went back into our records, and sure enough, we found nine footers, ten footers with copper armor with very large weapons next to them buried in the mound. So one, one spearhead, sort of, you look at it and they say ceremonial purposes. Well, that's, you know, if you don't even know the names of the people, 
How then can you possibly make that conclusion that this is ceremonial? What if it came from a mound that held a nine-footer? Now all of a sudden, this, this spearhead is no longer ceremonial. It is, in fact, utilitarian. And that's the paradigm we're working with, that these giants fled the promised land. They settled here in America and also settled in Peru. And what we found there was absolutely astonishing. Well, what did you find in Peru? Well, we went there because, I, once again, someone sent me a video. I have all these, little, all these people who sent, like, little spiders that go out on the web, and they're always sending me links, and I can't get to all of them. And sometimes the one that they, when they, when they send to me are life-changing, and the one that this particular person, I have no idea who sent it to me, was a shot of this man by the name of Brian Forrester, who I actually dedicated on the trail of a Nephilim too. And Brian was our guide and is featured heavily in Watcher 6, The Secret Cosmic War. And when we were in Peru, um, what led us there was Brian made these videos, uh, and he's in Paracas, Peru, which is a, a coastal city, and he's showing these elongated skulls. And we're just going, what is this? So we hopped on a plane. We, When I say we, Judd Burton, who's a, who's a, a history, a, a tenure professor, he's also an archaeologist, um, he's an anthropologist, he's a history professor, the guy's got multiple degrees. Joe Taylor, who heads up the Mount Blanco Museum, yeah, he is an expert cast uh, caster. He has cast dinosaurs and mastodons and saber-toothed tigers, which are in museums all over the world. The man is incredible at what he does. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me get some water here. <coughs> Ron Moorhead, who's an adventurer and private pilot, and, of course, Richard Shaw and myself. Richard is the co-producer and director of the Watchers series. Well, we flew to Peru. We met Brian, and we went to the museum in Lima, where they supposedly had a room of elongated skulls. Guess what, Dr. Scam? That room was under construction, and it had been so uh, for about four months, and those skulls, which we went to see, were no longer there. They were hold in the back thought, room. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and L.A. is simply saying that uh, since he began talking about these uh, giants and uh, t writing about them and doing videos on them, why he starts getting information from various people. And basically, uh, he was actually uh, told about these uh, elongated skulls in Peru. And so he went down there uh, thinking he was going to get, be able to see them in the museum. But apparently, they'd been uh, locked away uh, for several months. And so he at least well, initially wasn't able to see the, the uh, elongated skulls, but were these actually uh, simply uh, elongated simply be, uh, intentionally? In other words, did they bind the heads to do this? Or were these simply abnormal skulls because these belong to Nephilim or to giants of some sort? What do we know about these skulls? Well, it was interesting. Uh, I also went, wanted to see the two, what is called the two golden mummies, which were openly on display at the Lima Museum. And these... these um, these mummies, Dr. Stan, were seated, and they were over nine feet tall. They're gone. So we see that the window is closing. So we drove out to Paracas. We were able to actually well, handle... Well, that, L.A., before, uh, before you go on, yes. what happened to the sitting, uh, th these nine-foot giants? No one knows. Just, just like, the, just like the, uh, the Museum of Anthropology in Lima, that room that had all the elongated skulls, shut down, can't see it. You know, we were there. We, we talked to one of the... Um, um, not docents, but one of the people that were that works in the museum. They have 10,000 skeletons and 300 mummies. And where are they? They're in the back. Can we see them? No, you can't see them. Once again, the doors are closed. Can't see anything. But the private museum, which is where we wound up going, they still have the artifacts, Dr. Stan. And that's why we went to Paracas, because in Paracas there's a private museum. We got to go in there. I, it was like a kid in a candy store, and I don't mean that in a macabre sense of the wet of the word, but finally we had evidence where we could take DNA testing. We took back hair samples. We'll talk about the hair samples in a little bit. Out of the 40 skulls that we saw, about four of them displayed true genetic anomalies. The other ones were more or less head binded. But see, that brings us back to the, to the reason or to the question, why are these people emulating this shape? Why are they binding the heads of the infants to try to make this cone head? Head shape, what is desirable about them, about this shape? And we actually saw um, the, the actual um, device which is used to bind the, the child's head, the infant's head. 
uh, that's a picture of that is also in the book. It, that particular device was found in the Chongos graveyard, which is this ancient, ancient graveyard, thousands of years old, where we, we got to walk around and see it. The most bizarre place I've ever been. Potsherds everywhere, human remains, bits of skeleton, entire skulls. I mean, it, it's like it's like a nightmare. It really is. And it's, it's a desert, Dr. Stan. As far as you can see, it's just this, just this white sand. Looks like the Sahara. No, about a quarter of an inch, maybe a year of rainfall there. So everything is in a perfect place of preservation. And the skulls that we were handling were literally thousands of years old, literally. And we got to weigh them, handle them, test them, look at them. And what makes these skulls very unique, and as a, obviously as a medical doctor, you know where I'm going with this, but some of the largest skulls, and we could tell pretty much the difference between the male and the female skulls. The males, uh, the maxilla and the mandible, much more robust. Uh, there were brow ridges uh, right in the brow, very pronounced brows, almost like what you would consider Cro-Magnum. But in, in the ones that were not cradle headboard boarded, the genetic anomaly seemed to be the absence of two parietal plates. The human skull has four plates, the frontal plate, the two parietal, and the occipital plate in the rear. And these are all sort of stitched together. They call them sutures. And they are sutures. They hold the plates together. And that parietal plate, uh, when a child is born, um, there's a hole there. It's called a fontanelle, and that is open. As a child grows older, that fontanelle, of course, closes. Well, that parietal suture extends from the frontal plate to the occipital plate. And, is, and when a person gets maybe 80 or 90 years old, some of that suture disappears. But guess what? There's always a trace. Well, I, I went and Joe Taylor are, made a cast of what we believe is a female. I'm looking at it right now. And I've taken this to two different uh, dentists who have examined the teeth. And because of the wisdom teeth come in between 18 and 25, they're able to ascertain that this skull, because there are no wisdom teeth, um, and in fact, one of them shows a little bit of a bud coming in. One one dentist believed that this skull is about between 18 and 25. Doctor Stan, it shows no sign of a parietal suture. None. There's only one parietal plate instead of the two parietal plates. So the skull that I'm the cast that I'm looking at in Joe Taylor of the Mount Blanca Museum did the cast. It'll be um, at at Colorado, Doctor Stan. I can't wait for you to really look at it and and see it firsthand. But we believe this is a female, and we think that the, the hypothesis that we're going on is that there's genetic manipulation that's happening to these people. It's amazing it's more mysterious. No, is, are these Ma Mayan people? Are these no. Inca people? Are these things that predate those uh, they, Indian Yeah, but, they do. They're completely So basically, them. this is a thing you're not supposed to understand. I mean, the, the Mayans were there. They disappeared. The Incas were there. They disappeared. But here's another group that disappeared long before. We'll be back in a moment. Well, L.A., you go right ahead. Well, thanks, Dr. Stan. So we're, we're down in Peru, and we're looking at these elongated skulls, and we realize that the genetic anomalies that are there, um, I've had three medical doctors look at them, and Dr. Stan, when you look at the, the cast, that will be four. All of them agree that there's something going on. They're not sure what it is. We need DNA testing. One thing we were able to do was bring back hair samples from one of the skulls, and this skull is at least a 1,000 years old, um, there's no way to tell exactly how old it is, but it's anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 years old. It was found with a, as an infant, and when we go back in January, uh, Dr. Stam, and I'll show you, there's a picture of that in the book on the trail. Um, there's a picture of the, the infant skull, which, is, which has this very elaborate textile wrapped around it. Well, Senior Juan has given us permission, and Joe Taylor knows how to do this, and so does, of course, uh, we're down there with two archaeologists this time, uh, Judd Burton, and we will be able to soak this in a special solution and remove the binding or remove this textile from the head. And the reason we're doing this is because this skull is an infant skull and it's already elongated. And, and this sort of like blows the whole idea of cradle headboarding. But we were able to take uh, a hair, and this is where it gets really bizarre, but it ties in with my work. And Dr. Stan, I've been on your show many times, so... Uh, and I've talked about UFOs and the alien abduction phenomena and what we, what we believe is happening there, the implants, the genetic engineering, which is happening now. Remember, Jesus says it will be like the days of Noah when I return, which points us back to the days of Noah and begs the question, what differentiates those days from any other in all of history is the presence of the Nephilim 
are on the earth. Uh, genetic but just for the listeners out there, that this is not to suggest that L.A. is saying that the aliens are real. He believes no. in the demonic manifestations. And this is really what's so important. All of this talk about <coughs> UFOs is to mislead people and take them away from the real understanding of what's going on. Go right ahead. Well, we sat there and we, we brought back this sort of reddish auburn hair. First of all, it's not dyed. Native Americans did not have reddish hair. So whoever these Paracas people were came from someplace else and settled here about 3,500 years ago. Hold that thought, hold that thought, and we'll be back in just a <laughs> moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and suddenly L.A. is simply saying that uh, when they were suddenly in Peru at the private, uh, the private museum, they were able actually to actually uh, to get a hair, and the hair is a reddish hair now. Suddenly, the Mayans, the Incas, the other people didn't have reddish hair, so obviously if this uh, is, is reddish hair, and this goes back to suddenly... Uh, 3,500 years or so ago, when, of course, uh, this skeleton was a live human being, or perhaps it was a Nephilim. We don't know, and they're going to do a lot more in the way of study on this and CNA analysis. But fascinating information to realize that long before there was the Incas and the Mayas, there was another race here, and, of course, it's Lynn's... The L.A.'s uh, sort of contention. These could very well have been the Nephilim who actually fled the Holy Land Ahead, uh, after Jericho was destroyed, and of course uh, God had given the land uh, to the Jewish people, and they were going to claim it, and so the Nephilim simply fled, and uh, they fled, of course, across the ice, uh, so they, uh, in the winter time, and came into North America. Perhaps they went by boat. Under any circumstances, they settled all over North America and all over South America, and there's an organized effort by our major museums to conceal the fact that they have these giant uh, skeletons. Or the background of this other race. You're not supposed to know these things, ladies and gentlemen. Most of what you're taught in college, most of what you <laughs> read in the newspapers, most of what you see on television is designed not to educate you, not to reveal what's gone on in the past, but to conceal it. Well, before we go on, L.A., I want you to tell our listeners how they can get to your website and uh, suddenly get access to your excellent information. Thank you, Dr. Stan. It's lamarzuli.net, lamarzuli.net. You can get Watcher 6. And the new book, On the Trail of a Nephilim. By the way, Dr. Sand, it's an oversized book, 8.5 by 11, with uh, four-color printing. And, the, and the, you know, I have most books, the, the pictures are in the middle. Well, I didn't want to do that. It's just so cheesy. So we spent extra money. We made an oversized book, four-color printing, and the pictures are all the way through it. There's 120, at least 120 full-colored pictures uh, that are in there that were taken on site. So you really get the viewer, when you get the book, you really get an idea of what we're talking about. So it's not a little 5 by 8 book with a small little section of pictures or that are black and white in the center. Full color, 8.5 by 11, you really get a sense of what's going on. And that's, you save 10 bucks if you buy both of them together on the website. That's lamarzuli.net, www.lamarzuli.net. And you can avail yourself of what I believe is critical information because it really blows the lid, in my opinion, off the Darwinian paradigm and points to the biblical narrative as being the truth. Basically, of course, then you have the one book, which is called on the, uh, the Watcher 6, and then is the On the Trail of the Nephilim, a, a separate book? Yes. Okay, fine. So there are two books, because we actually carry the Watcher 6. And, uh, but anyway, you go right ahead. Yeah, Watcher 6 is the DVD. And on the trail of a Nephilim oh, is the book. Okay, fine. Well, that's that's what we have. We actually yeah. we actually yeah. have the book that they're talking and, about. Buy from Doctor Stan, folks. Support him. Okay. Support his ministry. We well, go right good. ahead. So anyway, so we took the hair, and we had a, a control sample of human hair. We had a dyed human hair to see what that would look like. We had the red hair, or the so-called auburnish red hair, from the the mummy from Paracas, Peru. That's at least a thousand years old. I'm being extremely conservative. It's probably closer to three thousand, but a thousand to two thousand years. Let's just call it a nap. And then, and then we we had a because of our, our lab assistant and because of what we travel in and do, a man had been abducted, Doctor Stan, and he had been forced to have sex with a hybrid being. And I realized that sounds crazy. Okay, but we have the hair from the hybrid female, which he had the presence of mind. When he awakened that morning to keep, it's, it's blonde, very blonde, almost whitish in color. So we took these hair samples and we, we went into a machine called Raman spectroscopy, 
which measures the molecular structure of whatever you're examining and plots it out on a graph so you can see what it looks like, okay? And the human hair just kind of does a nice little inverted U. It just kind of comes up, does a little U, and then trails off, all right? The dyed hair comes in at the same place the human hair, but goes right up to the, to the top of the chart and is gone. This is where it gets interesting. The hybrid hair, the white hair, and the reddish hair from Paracas, the slope on the graph, they track, Dr. Stan, and I'll show that in Colorado. And it's in Watcher 6. It will also be in Volume 2 because it, it's so important. And, and, and I've, I've showed this to um, a pastor, actually, who knew a lot about Raman spectroscopy. This is what his degree was. It was in, was in biology. And when I showed him this, he said, it, 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 you, you, can't, you can't look at this and know anything about what Raman spectroscopy is and understand that scientifically there's, there's got to be a connection between this so-called hybrid hair and this 2,000-year-old mummy hair from Paracas. There's a definite connection because the slopes match. Every little jot and tittle, every, every move, they match. So there's, there's a correlation between the hybrid hair and the mummy hair. And, of course, we are desperately trying to get DNA samples to do DNA testing um, because that will be, that's sort of, that's the final word. Until we get the DNA testing, we don't know. But that, that's what we've discovered. That's what's in the book. Um, and, and, you know, not only that, Dr. Stam, but when we went to places like Sakse Waman, Oyez and Tambo, Waitara, all, all very strange sounding names. And, and we flew to Nikusko and we went to a place called Sakse Waman. And it's about 12,000 feet above sea level. Very difficult to move. Well, at 12,000 feet above sea level, there was this very large wall complex. It's called Sakse Waman. And in it were these stones. And these stones were placed with such precision, without mortar. And the cuttings of the stone are polygonal. In other words, there's multi-sides to the stones. And these cuts go all the way through the stones. Yet, the stones were quarried 40 to 60 miles away and somehow moved and fitted to the site at, at, at 12,000 feet above sea level. The joints are so fine that you cannot stick a piece of paper through it, even a human hair. That's how tight the joints are. And what's amazing about this, we saw this in Cusco, we saw it again in Oyez and Tambo, we saw it at Saxe Raman, at Waitara. Whoever is building this is using building techniques that you would be hard-pressed. It would cost millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars, to be able to duplicate the stonework. And we're left with two, um, really, two scenarios. The one scenario is what the History Channel, with all due respect, and the ancient aliens and the ancient astronaut crowd are always trying to tell us that these beings came from Zeta Reticuli or the Pleiades. They were the ancient astronauts who we were visited thousands of years ago, the workings of Eric von Däniken. And that's the paradigm which has dominated the conversation literally for decades. But guess what? There's another paradigm. And that's the paradigm which I've written seven books about. And that is the idea that fallen angels once were here. In my opinion, Dr. Stan, these sites that I mentioned, Sakse Waman, Oye Tintambo, Waitara, and others down in Peru, all bear resemblance to, the, to what we see happening in Egypt with the Great Pyramid. And this, again, in my opinion, is Nephilim architecture. There's a supernatural element to it. The hand of a man cannot duplicate this stuff even <clears throat> today in modernity. And basically, because we've watched the DVD, and you'll see actually this architecture, these stones, beautifully crafted stone wall. And then suddenly later on, another stone wall was built on top of that to make it higher. But it was nowhere near, anywhere near as well done as this one that was done thousands and thousands of years ago. I mean, I think that was really what was so amazing as we watched your DVD. Yeah, it, it, it's all in Watcher 6, and there's still photos, of course, that are in on the trail with Nephilim, but when, when we're there, I mean, and, and this is why it's just watching a DVD, getting the book, it, it's, it's, it's like you're there, you're, and we're walking through it, and we're, we're, we're taking our time to, to talk to Brian about it, and we're, we're, the stones that were quarried were called andesite, and these stones are very, very hard, and copper chisels cannot shape them or cut them. 
So here, I mean, you've got a real conundrum. You've got a real enigma happening here. The Inca, who, who when the Spaniards came to Sox de Guatemala and they saw it, they asked the Inca, who built these? You know what the Inca said? The giants built them. It was here when we got here. We found it. It was here already when we got here. That's what the Inca told the Spaniards. I mean, this stuff goes back thousands and thousands of years and speaks of a technology which has been lost. We have no idea. And, and you know, Dr. Stam, some of these stones in Sacha Ramon, and they're megalithic. They're huge. They weigh between 40 and over 120 tons. A 120-ton stone carried 40 to 60 miles that shaped some of these stones. One, one of my favorite ones is one of the big ones with 10 sides that you can see. 10 sides to that stone shaped. And guess what? All the other stones that are around it fit perfectly. And it's not just, they're not just dressing the front of the stone. These cuts go clear through the stone and this create, and they're polished surfaces. And this creates an interlocking, uh, web of, of stonework, which has withstood thousands of years, including all the earthquakes in Peru. Nothing has moved. It's astounding when you see it, when you, when your hand touches it, when I, when I stood next to it, uh, when I held it, you know, beheld it from, a, a elevated place and look down on it. Mind-boggling. Absolutely mind-boggling. And, Chris, and, you get the impression that there was a, a degree of intelligence that existed oh. thousands of years ago that does not exist today. I mean, certainly we can move massive stones, but we yes. have to have massive uh, cranes and things to do it. They didn't have massive cranes. They were able to move these things. And have you ever seen some of the stones over there, certainly on the wall of the uh, of the Temple Mount of Israel? I mean, some of these stones are 40 feet long, 40 feet long and 15 feet high, and uh, maybe uh, 20 feet deep. How would you move a stone like that? You, human beings could not do that. So that almost as if there has to be another force there. And this is, I'm sure, the, the thought that there is a supernatural power these people tap into, which we don't understand. Yes. But then so much of what's going on today, you're not supposed to understand. You're not even supposed to question everything. You have to accept exactly what you're told by our, certainly our great museums like the Smithsonian, which is hiding many of these uh, uh, statues uh, of, of these creatures who were 12 or 14 feet tall or even taller. Go ahead. And we're there. We're looking at the stonework. And, again, there, there, it, it's one thing to talk about it and look at pictures, but when you're actually there on site, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. And I believe, Dr. Stan, that all, these, all, these, um, all this architecture was the remnant of some great civilization which covered the earth. And when we were in Watara, we, we came upon this Catholic church, and the Catholic church built um, over this site. And, and it's just, it's like night and day. You, you can see the original stonework, which is absolutely magnificent and perfect and so fine, once again, that the joints, <clears throat> you can't stick a human hair between them. And above it is what I would call indigenous or Inca slop. It's mortar, it's just every rock, the joints are huge. And above that is Spaniard, and there's Spanish, and there's the Catholic Church. Well, when you round the bend and you come into the courtyard, and I first looked at the wall, I turned to Richard, my partner in the Watcher series, and I said, "Oh my gosh, are we in Egypt or Peru?" Because the similarities between the structures is is just so just so obvious. And what we we had this sort of a cosmic download, Doctor Stam, when we were in Cusco, ruminating on all the things that we had seen. And it, I've never had this with another human being before. But uh, Richard and I are walking in the streets of Cusco. We had just left dinner, and we're talking about what we had seen and these artifacts and the fact that uh, earlier on in another watchers we had been to the Dallas area where we went to uh, Rock Wall, and we looked at that, and there was, like, all these ancient architecture, and something was going on, and that's when it hit us. And it's in the book, and, it, of course, it's, it's, in, it's in the DVD, that there was an ancient grid system. These stones have what's called piezoelectric properties. In other words, they can conduct electricity. These were not temples that were built. They were not temples. They were some sort of um, architecture which created either electromagnetic force fields or some type of a communication, and they were deliberately destroyed in some sort of a cataclysmic event. 
When we stood on Oyantan Tambo, there's only one wall that's intact. Everything else has been destroyed. And you can see where something, something very forceful and cataclysmic came in and, and destroyed this, whatever it was, this area. And the stones are smashed, and then they're on the, on the valley floor below. And, it, and it's everywhere. Something happened. What our theory was, and we're not the first three people to come up with this, because New Agers have been talking about this for decades. There was a grid that the ancients set up. And this grid is not a good thing, Dr. Stan. And this leads even more mystery and, and more depth to when Jesus says, as, as in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. We know that the fallen one will set up some sort of a global religion and global um, worldwide government. We know that. The book of Revelation tells us that that's what's going to happen. Well, Jesus tells us it will be like the days of Noah. And that statement is so pregnant with meaning, I believe I've just scratched the surface with it. There was an ancient grid that existed in the days of Noah that was destroyed. The fallen one has been trying to reestablish that grid over and over and over and over again. I'll just give you one, one little thing because I know we're running out of time before I come to the, to the punchline here. I interviewed a man by the name of Kelsey Stone, whose family, the Stone family, their grandfather bought this site, which they call America's Stonehenge. They've carbon dated it to 4,000 years ago. It's very, very old. Well, a henge is a circle, and this is, a, this is America's Stonehenge. That's what they've nicknamed it. And in the summer solstice, you can stand in the center of their circle and look out to a standing stone, which has been placed into the ground, and above that standing stone rises the summer sun, the summer uh, solstice uh, sunrise. And so Kelsey Stone's on Google Earth, and he decides to draw a line from the center of the hinge out to the standing stone and then extend it. So he does this, and he extends it and extends it and extends it and extends it further, and he goes across the Atlantic Ocean. But lo and behold, he winds up intersecting bisecting the center trilithon at Stonehenge directly in the center. You can't do that in the ancient world. I've gone to a surveyor in Malibu and asked, is there any way to do this in the ancient world? He says, no, you've got to be in the air to triangulate it to be that precise. He's gone thousands and thousands of miles, and that line intersects the center trilithon standing in Stonehenge, but way to get better. The Stonehenge in England, go ahead. Stonehenge in England. When he extends the line, remember, from New Hampshire to England, and it, and it bisects Stonehenge, the center trilithon. Trilithon is three, three, two, two pillars and a, and a cross stone. That's what the trilithon is, okay? When he extends that line further, he winds up in Beirut, Lebanon. Beirut, Lebanon is the home of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were the descendants from the Canaanites. The Canaanites were a Nephilim tribe. And basically, where is the American Stonehenge that you're describing? What's it's the, in New Hampshire. In New right. Hampshire, okay. New Hampshire. Ladies and gentlemen, th th these are things you're never going to hear elsewhere, but this is so vitally important. You understand that most of the truth you're never going to get from the radio media because it's controlled. What is its purpose? Not to reveal, but to conceal the past. And basically, there was other races of people here, and there were giants in the land, just as we're told in the Bible. We'll be back in just a moment to wrap tonight's program with L.A. Marzulli. Well, L.A., we've got three minutes for you to wrap up the program. Thanks and then so we'll much, Dr. Go. Stan, for, for having me on. Looking forward to seeing you and Barbara, of course, in Colorado, along with Chuck Missler and Gary Stearman, Tom Horn, and, and a whole host of other wonderful speakers. So it's going to be a fun weekend. But let me just wrap it up by saying this, that that ancient grid that was destroyed thousands of years ago and the fallen one, Satan, has been trying to reconstruct it, certainly with places like like um, Sacsayhuaman and like the Great Circle Mountain in Ohio. The grid is back, just like, we, just like he wants it, and we've helped him build it. That grid is the World Wide Web. Right now it's benevolent. It's not used to enslave the human humanity. But when the Antichrist comes, Dr. Stan, we know that you will not be able to buy, sell, or trade. And this grid of satellite and surveillance system, look at NSA, look at IRS, look what's going on, will be used to enslave every single human on this planet. This is why Jesus says, as in the days of Noah, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive, which means he's got to come back. It's our only hope, our only answer is in the second coming to put down this evil enslavement which is about to happen. 
I certainly agree with you. I think we're entering into some very, very difficult times. We're looking forward, both Barb and I are looking forward to seeing you uh, here in just a few days there in Colorado Springs. God bless. Thanks very much, Ellie. Thanks, Dr. Stan. Bye-bye. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation with L.A. Marzulli. I think he's certainly one of the uh, most courageous people. He's out there working uh, all across America, North America, and South America, trying to put together the pieces of this puzzle. And what is it to be coming up with? The fact that there were giants in our land as well as in in Sydney over in the, the Middle East, and suddenly going back thousands of years. And basically that there really are supernatural forces here. You hear all these stories about the uh, about the aliens and about the certainly the alien races and uh, these visitors from other planets. And this is all to confuse you so that you will not recognize that we're dealing with a spiritual battle and these are demonic beings and demonic forces. And there really is a supernatural element that you can tap into, but you tap into it at the risk of your eternal soul. Well, basically, of course, we do carry uh, Lynn's book, and it's a little expensive, but it has uh, really dozens of colored pictures in it. It's called Watcher 6, and you can get it by calling one 800 5448927. You'll find it fascinating. And he has something, you know, page after page after page of reproductions of the articles that come from newspapers and magazines a hundred years ago talking about the giants. And now, of course, everything is done to conceal that from the American people. And you're to believe what you're told by the media and you're told in school and you're told in college and you're told by the Smithsonian and other parts and parcel of this effort, organized effort to conceal the truth from the American people. And that is that we're involved in a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. And we're losing that battle because, of course, they've gained control of our, certainly, of, of the major elements of our society. They control our educational system. They've infiltrated our churches. They have their people planted in the media and the military and the banking and the corporations and in the government. And they're largely able to control what the American people think and believe. That's why you need to get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness. That's why you need to get the new, uh, Professor Ben Bagdickian's book. It's called The New Media Monopoly. Now, Professor Bagdickian is a, is a left-wing college professor. He thinks that the right-wing controls the media, but his book is excellent. Uh, he just doesn't understand the Trilateral Commission and the Brotherhood of Darkness, but his book, The New Media Monopoly, we recommend to you. And then, of course, we certainly have all sorts of uh, information available through Radio Liberty. To give you the background of what's taking place today, we have a four-CD set on the supernatural, a four-CD set on the supernatural, a four-CD set on satanic crimes. We have a book on satanic crimes. We certainly have Malachi Martin's excellent four-CD set. Uh, the wisdom of Malachi Martin. Malachi was a Jesuit priest, a confidant of Pope John the Twenty Third, and he tells you some of the most amazing stories about the Catholic Church. Stories that every uh, Catholic should understand. To in understand that their uh, religion has been infiltrated, just like the uh, Protestant religion has been infiltrated. Their dark and sinister spiritual forces that have captured controls of the reins of Christianity to neutralize the Christians in this country. And our job is to try to get them alarmed and educated. And that's why we hope that if you're out there in the listening audience, you go to our website, radioliberty.com. That's radioliberty.com. You can listen to our live programs there. Four hours a day, you can certainly get our archive programs, and they're all archived. You can listen to them 24 hours a day. You have our permission to copy our, uh, certainly our interviews and distribute them, even to copy our CDs and our, our DVD sets. And, but you need to get this information out. So many people are simply misled today and have no idea what is really going on in the world. And our job is to educate them, and that's why I do what I do five hours a day. And if you're in a position to help us finance our network of radio stations, we do have radio stations all across America. We have probably a close to 14, 15 outlets for this one program. But we need your help to maintain our network. And if you're in a position to join the Radio Liberty family of support, We'll appreciate your help. And if you're not in a position, then we ask you to pray for Radio Liberty for our provision and our protection. And we'll be back here in, in just a moment. Great.
regarding current operations. And I just want to go through a list of them very quickly of these facilities and corporations for which we have witnesses who uh, can be subpoenaed by the committees of the Congress. Uh, this was developed at the request of Congressman Christopher Cox of Orange County, and, with whom I met, and was later de further developed for uh, the briefing for, that we put together for President Obama. These facilities are the Edwards Air Force Base and subsections where uh, on at the uh, dry lake bed where the Lockheed uh, Skunk Works operations, Haystack Butte, China Lakes, George Air Force Base, and the closed Norton Air Force Base where an anti-gravity device, so-called alien reproduction vehicle, for which we have the schematics, was seen by Frank Carlucci and others on our witness team. Uh, tabletop Mountain and Blackjack Control. Uh, the aerospace facilities there are the Northrop Ant Hill Facility, Tihon Ranch, the McDonnell Douglas Lano Plant, Lockheed Martin Hellendale Plant, and the Phillips Lab. At the Nellis Air Force Facility, so-called Area 51, no one calls it that. There's S4 and S12, Pahoot Mesa, Groom Lake, and a no number of sub-facilities. The most important facility is in Utah, near Provo, the Dugway Proving Grounds, all of which is underground and the airspace above it is classified. There are no roads into this facility. The New Mexico facilities include Los Alamos National Labs with underground connectors to the so-called Dulce area where the biological work is being done and Kirtland Air Force Base. And the complex there includes Sandia National Laboratories, Phillips Labs, Manzano Me Mountain Weapon Storage Facility, Coyote Canyon, and the White Sands Complex. In Arizona, near Fort Huachuca, which is Army Intelligence Headquarters, there is a UGB underground base where one of our witnesses, who will testify, worked on nine separate extraterrestrial vehicles that had been downed through advanced electromagnetic pulse weapons, and there are several different species of extraterrestrial biologicals stored at that facility. The other facilities, and this goes on, uh, include the sh uh, a special compartmented area of Cheyenne Mountain where we have witnesses in our team who can be subpoenaed uh, where that we have tracked extraterrestrial vehicles in our solar system that we're measuring 26 miles in diameter. Uh, there are also uh, facilities in Australia, a key one being Pine Gap, the so-called Alice Springs facility, which is mostly a U.S. Air Force facility, even though it is in Australia. Um, I recently talked to the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia about this. Uh, also, the Redstone Arsenal and the Marshall Space Flight Center. We have a scientist at the Redstone Arsenal under, who works under contract for IT&T who have developed these transdimensional systems. He was under contract with my project to bring these energy devices out, and he was then threatened by a former CIA director and what I call the goon squad that went down there three years ago in March. This is just part of the information we have, and this information is on the flash drive given to Stephen Bassett's staff, then that you're all welcome to review. Thank you. Thank you. The Bible explains to us that a third of the angels, including Lucifer, were cast out of heaven to the earth. Everyone knows Lucifer the devil is evil. Lucifer is a liar, the great deceiver who hates us because God loves us. Lucifer wants to damn as many of us to hell with him that he can. The fallen angels mated with us, the women, and created half-breeds, or hybrids. Remember Noah's Ark? That's why God destroyed all the people, because the bloodline was corrupted by the angels, and everyone was evil except Noah's bloodline. This is what aliens do. How many cases of alien abductions have you heard of where the people have sperm taken from men and women impregnated only to be abducted later and their hybrid child taken from them? The aliens are creating hybrid, corrupting the bloodline. The Bible says that the end days will be as in the days of Noah, wicked and corrupted bloodline. Murdered babies from abortions are being used in flavoring additives in foods and pops, making the masses of people who consume it cannibals. Ever wonder why our military has zombie drills? 
where they are shooting down a bunch of unarmed people? What do zombies eat? Human flesh. To the elites, we, we are the zombies. The fallen angels taught man advanced technology to build monuments, buildings, weapons of war, etc. This is what the aliens are doing with our government right now in secret. Did you know there are ancient hieroglyphics with spacemen and UFOs? The so-called aliens have not just arrived recently. They have been here the entire time. They are the fallen angels. Both atheist and Christian scientific researchers have studied alien abductions and came to the same conclusions. Victims of both demonic possessions and alien abductions report having similar experiences. An ex-CIA agent in an interview gave a testimony of his encounter with several aliens in one of the underground government facilities. When he first saw them, he was startled and under his breath said, Jesus. He said the aliens screamed and took off running down the hall. The aliens, or fallen angels, continued mating with humans after the flood and over the centuries placed hybrids into key political positions of world leadership. Today, we know them as the Illuminati. This group of elite hybrids in positions of power all over the world decide on strategic plans concerning the New World Order takeover. They place presidents in office, they start wars, they plan the world economy takeover and more. The fallen angels have their own Ten Commandments called the Georgia Guidestones. Georgia is the state where legislation try to bring in guillotines for executions. It is all tied together by the Bible explaining that in the end days there will be a one world government, a one world currency, a one world religion, and the beast, who is Lucifer, will cause all to receive a mark in the right hand or forehead, and without it you can't buy or sell. The RFID chip is in place now with the scanning system and Obamacare will force everyone to receive it. It's written into Obamacare. This is why the NSA and the IRS are spying on, collecting, and storing all of our information in massive computer banks. Our personal information, including medical, criminal, financial records, religious preferences, political affiliations, everything about us will be available to the Illuminati through the RFID chips once people are implanted. The Illuminati is in the process now of destroying our economy along with other countries and taking away our freedoms. They can't take completely over yet because we won't give up our guns and we can still fight back. But Syria and the Ukraine were sovereign countries forced into war with our government's help to overthrow their governments and replace them with Illuminati hybrids. Soon all the countries will be controlled by the hybrid Illuminati elites or fallen angels and the Antichrist will begin his reign. Anyone who does not have the seal of God on their forehead or receives the mark of the beast will suffer the wrath of God and end up in hell with Satan and the other fallen angels. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. It's happening. Oh, you don't believe in God or hell? You better wake up. This is your wake up call.
And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No. Because I'm going to get him. This is the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is a live edition, a tremendous Tuesday edition, the 29th day of July 2014. I'm Doug Hagman in a studio with my co-host, my son, fellow researcher, Joe Hagman. Together we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. Folks, you're in for an incredible three-hour program tonight. You're listening to the only show where the news is presented to you in 3D. We look well beyond the headlines, the bylines, the fog of disinformation, misinformation to bring you the news behind the news. And we've got a couple of newsmakers for you tonight. I'm, I'm excited for tonight's show. For new listeners, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for dropping me an email. Kayla, Linda, Bob, uh, and others. I, I won't name them all. Uh, folks, we broadcast live each and every weeknight from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find us on the Internet at Homeland Security U.S. Com. We also have launched a brand new website that is dedicated to the Hagman and Hagman Report only. It's called HagmanandHagman.com. There, through one clicks, two clicks, whatever, you can, in fact, get the show. You, you, you can also download our free app for the uh, Android device, your telephone, whatever you might have at your disposal. That's HagmanandHagman.com. Folks, we're also simulcast by the HagmanandHagmanReport.com. Again, you can find that off of HagmanandHagman.com. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. Thank you for your belief, continued belief and trust in us as we walk through this minefield of current events together. Now, tonight, we've got a very, very important show for you. Let me just tell you, let me just read something very quickly here. Undoubtedly, the universe itself, look around you folks, the universe itself was created by God, but this does not mean that the, this original event was anywhere close chronologically to the current world of today, or, or even, even that uh, time flows in the same way as it uh, now does, for that matter. A close reading of the Bible supports this idea. Uh, an example, of course, is in Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse 3. And, uh, folks, you can get to your Bibles and read that as well. But we're talking about a different time, different era, different, uh, uh, a whole different uh, uh, venue, shall we say. But one thing that is continual, is clear as we speak, folks, media is not, well, media of all types is filled with various narratives about how we are being about how the world will be deceived in the coming days, regardless if it's information coming from elephant elements within the Vatican, New Agers, or other media outlets pushing the narrative of an alien savior. You've all heard that, right? Well, let me tell you something. The most reliable source you can get is the Holy Bible. And who better to describe to give you the information that you need for your eternal salvation, for this is what it's all about, then uh, and two, two terrific people, Mr. Steve Quayle, who you all know, stevequayle.com. He is an uh, avid researcher, fellow talk show host, uh, author, extraordinaire. By the way, folks, uh, tonight it would be who of you to order his book, Giants, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Giants, Genesis 6 Giants, off of stevequail.com. Also available, thanks to our very special guest as well, uh, who's going to be joining us shortly, Mr. Timothy Alberino, of the Alberino Analysis, accessible via stevequail.com. But having said that, Joe, welcome to the program. I'll let you bring the Glad guest in for tonight. Yeah, we have uh, Steve with us, uh, I believe, here. 
Uh, Steve, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi, Joe. And Doug, is uh, Tim on Please. yet? Uh, no, I'm going to try to see if we uh, we talked just before the show, so I'm going to try and, if he's having issues, try and help him out. Okay, good. Thank you, Joe. And Doug, good evening. Tonight we're going to take, uh, I'm going to introduce everyone to Timothy Alberino. Timothy is the uh, editor of the Spanish Genesis 6 website. Uh, it's an amazing bit of undertaking that he's done to translate so many uh, of the current articles, and obviously we've had translation help from other people. But tonight we're going to lay out the purpose of Satan and producing giants. You know, Doug, you you started this with the whole thing that the world's being prepared for an alien savior. And during my 43 years of research and arguing and uh, debating and bickering, and let's use the stop, better stop with those words right there, the one thing that has stood out in my mind over all these years is the fact that people will accept aliens creating us, people will accept aliens sexually molesting human beings, abducting them, uh, playing around with the human genome. They'll believe every single thing except the one book that spells it out in intimate and, and I would say, infinite detail, and that's the book of Genesis. When I started out on this quest 43 years ago, it was really out of my love for history, trying to figure out how the normal time frames would fit into what I knew to be uh, antiquity, much, much older than what was admitted to. Now, at, when I started this, uh, it, my love for history was before I became a Christian. It was during the university years. I got saved in 1972. I met Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, and he launched me into this whole thing and called me to it, and I guess I've been doing that and trying to walk out my my faith and my calling together. Now, what, I'm going to read something, and this is taken from the Dakes Bible, which I have, uh, rec I have quoted, I have uh, put it out on the Internet, and I also give attribution. So it was Phineas Dake that wrote this. And for the record, that's the guy that taught Pastor David Langford and I. We both were trained under Dake's Bible, and as he said, footnote to footnote, but this is coming from him, and I'm going to start out with why Satan wanted to produce giants. It's obvious, and my prayer tonight, and has been all day, and I know Romy's praying, Manette's praying, Bietha's praying, all the intercessors are praying, is that God's people will understand that, well, we don't have total revelation because we're finite. We have true revelation. I've never had so many fights with people, and I'm talking not fist fights, but if they could, they'd take their shots over this idea that the Bible is very explicit about fallen angels, angels that didn't keep their first estate, coming to planet Earth, cohabiting with Earth women, having sex and producing the mighty men of renown, the giants, all of the mythological creatures that we have basically uh, oral tradition or written accounts of come from this union. And here's we're going to talk about it tonight, and then Timothy's going to come on, and we're going to go into a time period that most people don't even know exists. The book of Revelation says the mystery of time when Jesus comes will be no more. So there is a mystery involved with this timing, but I believe that God will make known all of the truth that we can handle at the time we can handle it. So let me go there. The purpose of Satan in producing giants, and I'm quoting Phineas Day. It was the purpose of Satan and his fallen angels to corrupt the human race and thereby do away with pure Adamic stock through whom the seed of the woman should come. This would avert their own doom and make it possible for Satan and his kingdom to keep control of the earth indefinitely. It was said to Adam and Eve that the seed of the woman would defeat Satan and restore man's dominion, Genesis 3.15. The only way for Satan to avoid this predicted defeat was to corrupt the pure Adamic bloodline so that the coming of the seed of woman into the world would be made impossible. This he tried to accomplish by sending fallen angels to marry the daughters of men, Genesis 6, 1 through 4, thus producing the giant nation through them. There are two episodes, and here's where most people get confused, Doug and Joe and others. There were two episodes with fallen angels. There were giants in the earth in those days before the flood and also after the flood when the sons of God, the fallen angels, came in unto the daughters of men and any of the daughters of men, not, you know, just Seth or Cain or others, but they came and bare children unto them. Satan almost succeeded in his plan during the first episode, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Of all the multitudes of people that were on the earth, there were only eight, okay? There were only eight found not to have 
you know, corrupted bloodline. And that obviously was Noah and his sons. Now, we're not talking about moral corruption here. We're talking about genetic corruption. Noah and his sons were the only pure Adamites left to be preserved by the ark. Genesis 6, 8 through 13, 1 Peter 3, 19 through 20. The main object of the flood was to do away with the satanic corruption, destroy the giants, and preserve, I'm sorry, I can't say the word, preserve the pure Adamic line, thus guaranteeing the coming of the seed of woman as God had planned. Being defeated before the flood didn't stop Satan from making a further attempt to prevent the coming of the Redeemer, who would be his final downfall. It was now to his advantage that God had promised never to send another universal flood upon the earth. Satan therefore reasoned that he should make a second attempt to do away, do away with Adam's line. If he came within eight souls of doing it before the flood, his opportunities were now even greater with the promise that there would be no such flood. This is the reason the second group of fallen angels uh, married the daughters of men. Again, the unions produced giants whose races occupied the land of promise, where the seed should be born in advance of Abraham. Limited by his promise of no flood, God had to destroy the giants another way. This explains why he commanded Israel to kill every one of them, even to the last man, woman, and child. It also explains why he destroyed all the men, women, and children, besides Noah and his family, at the time of the flood, because it answers the skeptics' questions regarding why children were taken away with adults in the flood. God had to end this corruption entirely to fulfill his eternal plan and give the world its promised Redeemer. The Redeemer has come now, so Satan is... Uh, reserving his forces for a last stand at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the third way he's doing it, Doug, right now is through xenogenesis, the genetic manipulation by men in rebellion against God using science that has been given to them by fallen angels. And so that's where we're going into this three-hour uh, special tonight. And is Tim on yet? No, we uh, we're we're talking with him now, trying to figure out. Apparently, there's an issue with his Skype; it's not connecting properly to. Uh, well, hey, hey, Joe, if you can, just have him get on the regular phone line, the call-in line. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay, okay. Now, here's the thing, Doug, Joe, and everyone listening: the fact that fallen angels interfered with the human race is known to every civilization in the world. Whether they call them star people, star men, whether they call them whatever names they call them, we're talking about the genetic corruption of the human race. I've said on Coast to Coast for the past 20 years, isn't it funny that advanced civilization has to stop on Earth to have a sexual encounter one way or another with Earth women? And so it's amazing to me that, again, the and this is why I call it the sexual uh, corruption of the human race, it all enters around sex. Most of the practices that most people would uh, attribute to uh, ab abhorrent or abhorrent sexual behavior started with the fallen angels and started with the uh, whole corruption of the human race. By the way, the fallen angels weren't happy just in corrupting the humans. They corrupted everything. That's why you had all the strange prehistoric events. And by the way, I don't know if you saw it, Doug, but just last week a scientist was fired from one of the universities for claiming that the DNA proof proved that the uh, dinosaurs didn't pass away millions of years ago, but thousands of years ago. Did you see that story? He's now suing? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, incredible information, a incredible situation, I should say. Uh, wow. Right. Well, here's the thing. You know, a lot of people refer to ancient manuscripts and I've spent 20-plus years at least going through ancient manuscripts as I can get them. Now, I don't read the original languages like some of my critics do, but then i got to share this with you. The guys I quote from are beyond what the critic's skills and abilities are. So I go with if, if the foremost Hebrew scholar in the world says something or multiple Hebrew scholars or multiple Greek scholars say it, then by consensus I can tell you that it seems to be that the people fighting this revelation that I believe God wants us to have in the end times, the hardest are supposed evangelical Christians. If I told them that last week or two weeks ago, forgive me, that the British Museum and others were talking about the Sumerian Table of Kings being 241,000 years old and that certain kings lived from 36,000 years to 28,000 years old, they'd just say, oh, that's all fantasy. Yet the same records that indicate the life of earthly kings also meaning the non-God kings that followed these earthly kings that were descended from the stars, 
it was fascinating that why would they switch? Do you think they really were on the sci-fi channel turning into their own, uh, you know, uh, if you will, tale telling? I don't think so. The point is, is that everyone's willing now to accept the fact that there are aliens out there. Obviously, the powers that be, the Illuminati, has kept that secret until the time of the revealing so they can spin it to ultimately control humanity and bring us under uh, subjection. The very fact that Tom Horn and Chris Putnam have uh, interviewed the Vatican astronomers from Cosmolagno and others and the Lucifer Telescope in Arizona. I believe Tom and Chris have put forth an accurate presentation. And again, this is not an attack on the Vatican per se. It is saying that the Vatican <laughs> expects extraterrestrial saviors to come onto the world, and the argument is, can they be saved? Are they, are they uh, subject to the, the redemption of Jesus Christ. That's what the argument is. Not that they're coming, okay? Not that we're as a source of them. And I find it ironic that the very people that are embracing this are also having to put a call out for more exorcists because demon possession is becoming more pronounced and acute. Is Tim, is Tim on yet? He is indeed, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, Tim Alberino. Welcome to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Thank you. We had to let out a little bit more string along with the coffee or the uh, tin can, but we got you, and it's great to have you, sir. <laughs> can you guys hear me okay? We can, yes. Okay. Go ahead, Tim. I, wa I want you, and we're going to touch on something that's really, really important tonight. Tim, I want you just to share how you got involved in this research uh, years ago and kind of give a little bit of your background so people understand you. They see you on the Alberino analysis on my website and on YouTube, but go ahead and share, and then we're going to go right into the period prior to the creation of Adam and Eve with the Golden Age and how we can reconcile by the Word of God, the time frames that most people just can't simply grasp in their mind. Go ahead, Tim. Yes. Um, well, it's, a, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be on the broadcast with you guys this evening. Um, but, yeah, I'll just jump straight into it here. Um, I, uh, I'm going to have to go into a little bit of my background, Steve. I just butt in if I start get, getting into the weeds here. But um, I'm... Um, where I am now is a product of a, of a very unusual situation. When I was a young man, 18, 19 years old, I decided to, there were some catalyzing events in my life that led me to make the radical decision to basically just move to Peru by myself. And uh, I had a very specific goal in mind. I was driven um, by a desire to... Uh, to know God more, to 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 have a more tangible relationship with Jesus, and uh, so I went to to Peru and and basically wandered around for some years, or not some years, for some months. Ended up, long story, really short, really long story, really short. Ended up in the Amazon jungle, uh, outside of the city of Iquitos, some three or four boat days boat ride up a river. Uh, with a group of lumberjacks, and, and basically something happened to me. I can't go into the details uh, about that at this time, but something happened to me there that changed my life. Suffice it to say, I am a living testimony of the of the presence and power and protection of, of, of the Lord and of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, my experience in, in Peru, my experience in the Amazon and just in Peru in general, really began to change my mentality uh, my worldview, my paradigm, because I grew up in a <clears throat> in a in a Christian home. My father was a pastor, a very good pastor, and my father and my mother loved and served the Lord, and they taught me and my siblings to do the same. And uh, my my father uh, instilled in me a desire and uh, the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus, intimacy with Jesus. So that's where this all begins. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's where the, the beginning of everything that we're going to talk tonight began with me, and, and obviously you could say the same, with the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so uh, I've always had a desire for the Lord. I've always had a desire for the, for the tangible reality as opposed to what I perceive to be synthetic reality, you know, of, of uh, public school and, you know, this, just the mundanity of life. drove me crazy even at a young age. So um, I had this driving desire for intimacy with the Lord. L again, long story short, it led me to the Amazon jungle. I know that sounds weird, but you know, I'm writing a book about it. I can't go into the details at this time. But 
you know, it was there. It was in, it was in that period of my life. I was a young man, 19, 20 years old. When the let's just say that the Bible began began to become tangible, tangibly evident to me, and um, I began to experience some things and to see some things, and and I'm not necessarily talking about some kind of a prophetic experience, <clears throat> but even encountering a lot of the legends and the lore of the peoples of the jungle and the different tribes and the different people I would come across um, traveling around Peru as a young man were verification of all the things that. Uh, you know that 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 the things that Steve's been talking about for years, for example, the giants and the stargates and the ancient technology and all this kind of stuff. That stuff began to be evident to me, not not because I had ever studied that stuff, but because I was beginning to see evidence before I even knew what I was looking at. <clears throat> and ironically, you know, ironically, uh, growing up as a believer, um, um, growing up in a good church with a good family, um, I. Obviously, was my, we do Bible studies with my dad, and, and, he, and, and my dad and mom taught us uh, many, many things, um, especially about the gospel and about, like I said, intimacy. But uh, there was one story that my dad would always tell me about when I was when I was uh, when I was in grade school. It was the story of David and Goliath, obviously a very popular story. And my dad would always talk about Goliath and how big he was and describe how big he was. He was this giant, you know, his head would go through the roof if he were standing here, and and that. That was just always such an astonishing thing to me, that there, that there could have existed a giant. And a lot of people, uh, you know, growing up, especially people who've grown up in church life, take a lot of that kind of a lot of that stuff for granted. You know, they read about giants or angels or demons, and and they take it for granted. But I was awestruck by it, by just the notion that there existed a giant. I wasn't even thinking in terms of giants or races of giants. Just there existed a giant Goliath, and. Uh, and, you know, so there, there were seeds planted in me early on. And then, of course, I came upon Genesis 6. And, and um, um, obviously, Genesis 6 was always extremely provocative and, intri- and intriguing to me. You know, who were these Nephilim? What, what was the situation? You know, even before I ever got into any of the theological studies on Genesis 6, just as a little boy reading Genesis 6, there was something so mysterious, so profound, wrapped up in those, those handful of verses and, and I just knew, even at a young age, there was something there. So fast forward again to Peru. And, uh, again, I'm seeing some evidences, some things, hearing stories, encountering all kinds of supernatural stuff out in the middle of the wilderness. Um, and uh, just really, really, at this point in my life, really starting to say, now, wait a minute, there, there's, something, there's something going on here. There's, even though I grew up as a Christian all my life, I'm missing something. It's like I'm missing a big piece of the pie here. There's something missing. There's something vital uh, that I need to complete my paradigm. You know, you can call it my Christian paradigm. I felt like there was something lacking. And just around that time, I began to uh, look into the, the, this issue of giants and, and uh, the fallen angels in Genesis 6. I actually start to do a um, more of a studying approach to find out what, what exactly was going on. And, and, of course, I came across Steve Quayle stuff. And uh, Genesis, the book Genesis 6 Giants, which, by the way, is a must-read for anybody that's foggy about this situation at all. And, you know, coming across all these different stories of the, um, um, the different explorers, you know, obviously the famous explorers, uh, Steve could rattle them off, I can't think of their names at the top of my head, that actually would run into giants. Uh, you know, and during their travels in South America and Central America, that they, they would actually encounter these tribes of giants. And then, of course, you know, it's the rabbit hole. Uh, uh, you, you start to think, wait a minute now. Well, how come no one ever talked about this in school? And, where, and what about, you know, all the, all the stuff about anthropology that I taught us? Isn't this an important uh, piece of information here that, that, that's missing, that, you know, these, these explorers, these well-known explorers documented encountering these giants that were 15 feet plus? you know, tall, and, and that, that, that seems pretty profound to me. And, of course, again, the rabbit hole, and I always like to say the rabbit hole isn't like a gradual decline. It's just a straight drop. Once you get down, I mean, once you start going down that hole, it's almost like a bottomless pit. One thing leads to another. And if you have a biblical worldview, uh, the beautiful thing about all of this is it's all verifiable in Scripture. It's there. And, you know, the, the, it's like the Lord has hidden within the pages of Scripture all these mysterious things that unless you know, unless you have a heart desiring truth, unless you're a lover of truth, you, you know, 
and you're not just doing a peripheral read of the Bible, you're, you're not going to find these things, even though they're evident and, and, and they're there, you know, hidden within the pages of the Bible. And so I began to uncover all of this, and, and basically um, one thing led to another, and, and the Lord just was driving me forward in all of this. And, and uh, you know, so I went from giants to studying about the fallen angels, the giants, the Book of Enoch, you know, um, stargates, uh, and then, of course, I came to the alien subject, and, and all along the way, what was grounding me, what was pulsating in the background of all of this was the revelation of Jesus Christ, because that was the beginning of, of this journey for me, uh, was how does this fit in? What is going on? Why is this important to our time? So that's just a brief introduction to where I come from, uh, Steve. Well, I, 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 go, go ahead, Doug. The other thing that, that you know, is interesting. When I met Tim, he had a pretty amazing handle on what was going on, and and especially with the understanding. I mean, just to make it clear, uh, I, I'm not giving away anything he wouldn't want me to say, but he had the supernatural encounter with the powers of darkness, so you can't convince him it's not real. And so we're talking tonight about the fallen angels, and which, by the way, are always males. No matter how cute the uh, Victoria's Secret models may be, and isn't it fascinating to everyone around, whether you're watching the Axe commercial, AXE, I think it's a men's spray on you know, deodorant or perfume body wash or something, and also uh, the Victoria's Secret. Isn't it amazing that there's always, and, and just think about this, why angel wings and why seduction? Well, the, the, here's one thing we got to make clear going right into this. Angels do not die. They can be bound, which the scripture says, First Peter talks about certain angels bound in everlasting chains of darkness. The giants can die, do die, and when the giants die, their spirits became demons, D-E-M-O-N-S, upon the earth. I hear the word demon and fallen angel interchangeable. It's wrong. It's not even it's not even correct. The Greek word for fallen angel is totally different than demon. So the point being, and even just plain angel, you know, here's the thing, Doug. People have got to understand that there is a supernatural war going on. And when we talk about the stuff we're going to talk about, we're going to go right into the pre-Adamic. Nothing makes people get more mad than when you explain to them that God recreated the earth in Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2. In the book of Isaiah, it says God did not create the earth, tohu and bohu, without form and void. Then you go to Genesis 1, 1, and you start to find out that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Is that a contradiction? No. It's talking about two separate creations. You don't plenish the earth, or you may plenish the earth as if you dress something for the first time, but if you redecorate or you replenish, that means you bring back into being something that already has. I think this has been the most controlled, uh, if you will, and, and vaulted, meaning people don't want the believers to know this truth, because first of all, what you're going to find out when you find out about this stuff and God grants it to you by revelation, not just by head knowledge, you are so blown away by the majesty of Jesus. You are so overwhelmed with God's love, his mercy, his compassion. You are so filled with understanding of what it really means to be redeemed. I can tell you this. I've talked to Christians who have been saved for 30 and 40 years. I said, what were you redeemed from? They don't know, or they'll cop out and say, a life of sin. I said, but what was the purpose that Jesus was manifest for? The scripture says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the evil one. So, and you know, having 43 years on the battlefield, I can tell you, probably one in a thousand could answer that question. I'd like to think that after all these years on the radio, almost anybody who listened to me could answer that question. But why it's critical is this. When we're talking, and Doug, I just sent it to you, and I know, Tim, you've seen it, the Sumerian Table of Kings, when you've got something going back 241,000 years, and there's a transition from a period before, then events that came in, and by the way, the event that took place the first time when these pre-Adamic civilizations were wiped out was Jeremiah's flood. We'll get to that in the book of Jeremiah. But the point is, is that it, 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 the Bible says that it remains within a heart of a king to search out these things. So 
Jesus is king, and, and I think it's amazing, Doug, that the all of the secret societies and all of the uh, illuminated brotherhood and sisterhood and devilhood and, and Robin Hood, all the hoods, okay, basically have tried to keep all this arcane knowledge hidden, and they pass it on to their students or what are called adepts. So right now I'm going to give it back to Tim. And, Tim, I want you to, to deal with the pre-Adamic period as the Lord revealed it to you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we tell everybody, take this stuff to the Word of God. And while you're doing that, Tim, when you're done, just go ahead and give it back or give it to Doug, whatever, because this is such an important subject. This is the key. Everyone, this is the key to understanding all strife. It's the key to understanding all warfare, all wickedness, and it's the true revelation of the manifest uh, grace of God in our life, redeeming us from all this stuff that's coming upon the earth. Jesus said that just as in the days of Noah, and 99% of the Christians can't even begin to fathom the days of Noah. And the the current movie out with Russell Crowe was basically, I would just say this, that the only thing that that had in common with the Bible was a guy named Noah, the name only. Uh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, well, you know, um, I remember when I began to think about when it first dawned on me this pre Adamic, uh, the notion of a pre Adamic world was when I was considering, you know, why in the world do the planets in our solar system look like they've, you know, that, that, that they've been bombarded and the, yet the Earth seems, seems to have escaped whatever happened to those planets? But then, of course, once you delve into the pre Adamic stuff, um, uh, like Steve was talking about, and, and uh, uh, Derek Prince talks about the pre-Adamic stuff. I've heard, I, I used to listen to some stuff from him on the pre-Adamic stuff, and also Chuck Missler. And once you delve into that, you begin to realize that it becomes apparent pretty quickly. If you really take a good, honest look, and you're not biased from the get-go, you take a good, honest look at the scriptures, all the different scriptures that, per- that could pertain to the pre-Adamic world, um, is that something catastrophic happened in this solar system, and not just on the Earth, but in this solar system, but, but also to the Earth, something catastrophic happened. And then, and then when you take a look at all these ancient cultures, they say the same thing. Something catastrophic happened to the Earth at one time. And uh, interestingly enough, a lot of these ancient civilizations, um, the, the high civilizations, the Mayan, the Aztec, the, you know, the different civilizations, even civilizations, mythical civilizations like the Atlantean civilization, all tell tales of usually not one, but two cataclysms or more that occurred on the Earth. Of course, uh, it's almost universally known uh, that there was a flood, a universal flood on the planet, but also a cataclysm that occurred before that flood. And so um, not only in Scripture, but even when you look at the, the, the human records on the planet, you see that something catastrophic happened, catastrophic happened to the Earth. And, uh, you know, and it could be, and of course, when you get into the, pre- the realm of the pre-Adamic, I think the fact that there was a pre-Adamic world, I think that's solid in Scripture. But there's a lot of postulation, you know, um, that, that, uh, uh, about what might have been going on in the pre-Adamic world, because it doesn't really, the Bible doesn't really tell us black and white exactly what was going on. But there's good reason to believe that there was some kind of civilization happening in the time before Adam. And, of course, civilization, uh, a civilization that did not include and did not involve human beings, but that, it, but that was a civilization of either some kind of angelic being or uh, some kind of other non-human entities that were, that were living and existing in a world before the Garden of Eden, before God remade everything. And, and just that thought alone is, ex- is, is exceedingly provocative and intriguing. And um, so, of course, I started to... to, to think about this and to delve into it. Uh, and there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of postulations that, that, that you could come up with about, you know, was it Satan who ruled over the uh, pre-Adamic world? That's a very, I think that's a very logical uh, conclusion for somebody to draw, that Satan did, in fact, rule over the planet uh, before the creation of man, before the first cataclysm, when, when judgment fell. And it's obvious, like Steve was talking about the Tohu and the Bohu, it's obvious that, that something not pleasant happened to the earth before, you know, you get into the story of God remaking everything, you know, let there be light and all this other stuff. Something cataclysmic, something that, that smacks of judgment happened. And obviously we know that Satan fell and um, that uh, there was a rebellion of some kind. And there was a rebellion of some kind before, 
human beings came around. We don't know how old the angels are. We don't know when they were created or how long they were around, they were around before the earth was created. But we know that the, the book of Job tells us that the Benai Ka Elohim, the sons of God, shouted for joy when the Lord formed the world. So um, they were definitely around to see the formation of the earth. So there was, there's a whole history. There's a whole background of stuff that we don't understand. And this is something that I always like to um, and sort of try to expand, especially believers' minds, when it comes to the terms, um, understanding terms. We use the term angelic. We talk about angels. But understand that the term angelic is a very nebulous and broad term. In other words, uh, it, it, saying angel, is, is, it's almost like uh, saying insect. It's not putting your finger on one specific kind. It's, it's classifying a group of entities or beings, and within that group there's, a lot of categorization and compartmentalization. You know, you have all different kinds of angels. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very possible that before the human race came into being, there was a very sophisticated, advanced, complicated um, civilization that existed on this planet. And there's something very unique about this planet. I mean, there's something very unique about it. It's amazing, even when you just look, like I said, when you just look at the solar system, here you have this, this blue planet, you know, in the midst of, of, of these other planets that are just desolate and, and have uh, apparently been subject, subjected to some kind of catastrophe uh, that, that, they've, that they've never recovered from. But then you have this blue, uh, blue beautiful planet teeming with life. Why is the Earth so important? Why is the Earth so precious? Why is the Earth so coveted? You know, of course, these are questions that w that that uh, uh, begin to pop into one's mind when they're when they're thinking about pre Adamic stuff. And 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 again, there's there's good reason to believe, or at least it's logical to infer, I would say, that uh, that the devil, uh, that Satan, obviously before he was the bad guy, had some kind of rule or authority on this planet. That may be that may in fact be one of the reasons why he's so jealous and upset with the human race. Um, because obviously when God created Adam, he, he gave dominion of the earth to Adam, you know, and so... Uh, yeah, let me, let me jump in here. Yeah, let me jump in here, Tim, because again, all things that we're giving, you've got to take the Lord in prayer, but I'm going to give you the scripture, ladies and gentlemen, for what we're talking about. In Jeremiah 4, 23 through 27, it's interesting because this is Jeremiah the prophet. He's saying, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. So he's beholding something that God is declaring in Genesis. This is a previous flood. Now listen to this. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. It basically, in the original language, says there was no man. There was no Adam. This is prior to the creation of Adam. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And here's the clincher. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus saith the Lord God. God, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Second Peter 3, 5 through 13 says this, For this they willingly are ignorant of that, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Verse 6, Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This isn't talking about Noah's flood, because obviously enough, Noah and his family and the animals didn't perish in the second flood. It's called the First Earth Age. And, Tim, I want you to get into right now Pember's book, because I've stated on Doug's show and on Coast to Coast and other places, I think you've even heard me, that probably the most amazing book written so many years ago by Pember and how it's relevant Earth's earliest ages, because, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about a time when pastors gave themselves to this kind of quest for knowledge, when people would pray and pray and pray for years upon end to get God's answer. But when God would speak, the answer would cause the earth to tremble. And I'm praying tonight that God's going to give some of you answers, especially those of you who are bound up in the alien deception that are going to be swept away by uh, signs and wonders, lying signs and wonders, when the heebie-jeebies show up, uh, you know, and get the full blessing of the Vatican. 
And again, ladies and gentlemen, I will not argue that point. Tom Horn and Chris have put enough documentation into Exo Vaticana uh, before uh, Malachi Martin was murdered, and he was totally murdered. Uh, he dealt with the issue, and the point is, is that whether you like him or not, you see, this is the thing, Tim, Doug, Joe, people don't like what sometimes when you tell them what happened, but it doesn't take away from the fact that some guy really did get murdered. It doesn't take away from the fact that he knew he was he was going to be murdered. It doesn't take away from the fact that what was it that caused him to get murdered? And in, in Martin's case, it was a fact of basically saying Satan is enthroned in Rome. And if you've heard Henry Groover's vision, which he's spoken, Doug, on your show about, uh, last time I was on with Henry on you, and he talked specifically about being translated in the spirit to the streets of Rome and binding those two fallen angels. Do you remember that, Joe and Doug? Absolutely, I do. Yep. To me, that's one of the most earth-shattering, the most truly revealing uh, statements. If you know Henry, he's probably the, the, just one of the most lovely, and I mean this totally, lovely and meekest men in the earth. But boy, talk about authority in God. So when he said that, I showed him some pictures. And, uh, Tim, I don't know if you've ever seen the pictures. Uh, ask me next time we get together, and I'll show them to you. But I showed him pictures that Brian Snowdy, who, in my opinion, is one of the finest artists in the world, and he's the guy that you see doing all my sketches. True Legends was done by him, the cover. But I related to Brian Snowdy what a four-star general had related to me. I then showed the four-star general in Special Forces, and he's still active. Uh, the bottom line is, is this what you guys deal with? And the general said, that's, that's, that's as accurate as a photograph could be, okay? So I don't know how Brian did it. I believe God anointed him to do it. Snowdy, S-N-O-D-D-Y. If you go on my website, stevequail.com, uh, all of those illustrations, which, by the way, I own the copyright for, they always show up in other people's uh, stuff, you know, and and the point is, is that I don't mind it. They at least give attribution, but you know, you can't go to, you can't. Uh, how do I say this? Steal, and, and then they want to make it their own. Well, that's that's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. But the point is, is that when Henry bound those two entities, they were fallen angels. They were not demons, and they were not giants. Even though the fallen angels that he bound were huge. So the point is, is we're talking about Jeremiah 4, 23 through 27, talking about a pre- or prior Adamic flood. We're talking about, and Doug, I, I gave it to you if you want to put it up on your website or to show people. We're talking about the Sumerian uh, pyramid uh, cuneiform. It's kind of like, actually, it's more of a, uh, it's very small, but it talks about the table of kings going back 241,000 years. Well, if fallen angels don't die, then I don't think they have to worry about uh, you know, going to AARP, which is, you know, an angelic version of, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, the bottom line is they don't die. Now, God can bind them. God can banish them. God can do whatever God wants. But unfortunately, mankind in its rebellion against God is opening up the stargates, opening up the prison gates. And I just got an email prior to the show, and one of the brothers I think is pretty astute. You know, you can explain away the giant holes in the earth, but I think what's amazing to me is when you think of the Word of God that we don't need to fear those things coming up on the earth. If it's coming up on the earth, it has to be under the earth. So, Tim, t tell about Pember and Earth's earliest ages and how that's blowing your mind and just how prophetic it was for the time we now live in. Yeah, um, Steve gave me a copy of Earth's earliest ages. I think it was what, something like a month ago, maybe. Uh, maybe a couple months ago. I've been wanting to read it. I, I had heard uh, Steve and uh, Tom Horn talk about Earth's early stages uh, on the Hagman Show, and, um, and and I've always wanted to read it. Well, I've just recently, over the last month, been reading Earth's earliest stages, and there is some of the most uh, profound stuff in this book, and it's not just about pre-Adamic stuff. I mean, this guy... He had some profound insights about a whole bunch of stuff as, you know, uh, through the course of this book. He starts off talking about the pre-Adamic stuff and uh, laying out all the main points to the pre-Adamic to, to the, you know, what's called the gap theory and all that. And then uh, he, he ends the book by dealing with uh, what was a very prevalent and powerful phenomenon of his day called spiritualism and theosophy. And, uh, you know, we, we now have a society that is seething with spiritualism and the tenets of theosophy 
and, um, and, and it was just beginning in Pember's day. So, you know, uh, George Pember was, uh, born between 18, was born in 1837. He lived in 1910. So he lived right in that critical era when, listen, if, 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 if the, to the listeners, if you have not done a study or at least factored in to the end-time scenario, the occult, the rise of the occult, in the late 19th century, it is absolutely crucial to understand the things that are happening now, to connect the dots to what was going on in the late 19th century with the occult, right during the time when George Pember was, was, was doing his work. And uh, George Pember was an was a English theologian, and he was affiliated with the Plymouth Brethren. And uh, like I said, he deals with the pre-Adamic stuff. And, and, it, and I was just commenting, commenting to Steve this morning how timely it was for Pember to connect uh, the pre-Adamic world. He makes a connection in the book, and it's not even a, an obvious connection. It, it's almost like a subliminal connection he's making in the book, Earth's Earliest Ages, with the, the, the movement of spiritualism and theosophy. And theosophy was a, uh, uh, it's, it's a branch, basically a, a offshoot of, spirit, of what's called spiritualism, which is kind of a very general term. Um, but it's, uh, you know, Madame Blavatsky, and, and it was very influential and is still very, 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 very influential, even in the, uh, with the Illuminati and the, and the New World Order and all that kind of stuff. But here is Pember, right during the rise of spiritualism. And, and, and something that I found amazing during my, um, during my studies, something I ran into, I wasn't expecting to find it because I'd never heard about it, but when I found it, pieces started falling into place. And it's simply this. Uh, many people do not understand what the climate was, the spiritual climate was before World War I and before World War II, but especially before World War I in the early uh, 20th century, the late 19th century, um, when, <clears throat> when um, you know, when the Protocols of Zion were written, you know, back in that period of time, before World War I, the, there were so many seances happening across this country. I mean, it was so prevalent, and uh, that's, that's often a, an issue that's overlooked. Even in ufology, even when you talk about the, the, the return of the Nephilim and all this kind of stuff, listen, a gateway was open. Something happened right during Pember's time, right when this guy was writing Earth's Earliest Ages. That's why he addresses it in his book. A gateway was being opened, not just over this nation, but globally, a gateway to the, to the demonic, to the supernatural, to the, to the, to the uh, dimensions of the fallen angels, or however you want to put it. Something that the, the stage was literally being set by, a, you know, by millions of people collectively around the globe, uh, delving into the ancient mystery school, getting back into the, to the hidden things the, that only the initiates of the Masons were studying at that time and all, this other, and all these other secretive groups. This suddenly be, began to saturate popular culture. It began to, you know, as they were, remember, you know, uh, there were certain people doing seances in the White House. Of course, everybody knows the famous situation with Nancy Reagan doing seances in, in the White House. In the 80s, but but way back in the beginning, before World War, War One, in the early 1900s, man, the spiritualism and and uh, Pember called it intercourse with demons. Uh, and, and when he says that, he's not necessarily using that in the, as the sexual term. He's just talking about communication, the desire to commune with the spiritual world. I mean, it was so powerful during the 1900s that if you do not factor that in to what's going on now to the end times, to the alien agenda, to the, to the new world order, to all this different stuff happening now, you're, believe me, you're missing a huge piece of the puzzle because right after that came World War I, came World War II, came the explosion of, of UFOs and all this different stuff happening. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the formulation of the new world order began to go into high gear. Something happened, something very dynamic happened right during the time that Pember wrote this book. And I think it, 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 it's amazing that the, the insight that this guy had uh, when he was writing during the time in which he lived and the genius, and, and I know it was the, the, the spirit of the Lord that, that was influence, influencing him to connect the pre-Adamic times to the spiritualism and the last days that were coming. And, um, and one of the things that... Uh, uh, that Pember talks about is, uh, you know, this, this, this notion that 
you know, I'm going to jump forward here because remember, this is something that uh, he jumps from the pre Adamic times or the antediluvian times, and um, and that's that's the next stage. When when you're when you're studying this stuff, there's two very important things that that we have to grasp as believers. One is the pre this, this notion of the pre Adamic world, and there's reason reasons why it's important to understand at least be open to the notion that there was a pre-Adamic world, because it directly relates to some of the UFO stuff and some of the, the entities that are even now moving, and whether people believe it or not, moving behind the scenes in politics, and, and, and we're talking about non-human entities, and you know, some of which most likely came from a pre-Adamic world. And so, so basically, Pember moves from the, uh, uh, the pre-Adamic world into the antediluvian world, and which is the pre-flood world. So you have this something happening before Adam, then Adam shows up. Something very unique, something very special happens for the first time. God says, let us make man in our image. This is something that, this, you know, you could imagine the reaction of the angels and all the other entities that were in existence, you know, doing a double take at that. What did, he, what did they just say? What are they going to do? They're going to make us in, in, in something of, of being now in, in, in his, God's going to make one in his own image? I mean, this must have been a shocker. And uh, you can imagine how it could have produced jealousy and envy and hatred in the rebellious, uh, those rebellious beings, the, the, the fallen angels and the other entities that were rebellious against God. And so suddenly Adam shows up on the scene. And God has a very unique and special relationship with Adam, obviously, as, as, the, as the, the, the Bible clearly indicates, and with the human race. After all, he sent his son to redeem us, to purchase us with his blood. He has a very unique relationship with the human race, and that's what Steve was saying. People don't even know, believers don't even realize, they don't even know what they're being redeemed from, and I would say redeemed from and redeemed to. We're being returned. We're being set back to the blueprint of what Adam was. That, I mean, Jesus is literally, he's the second Adam. He's restoring all that was lost in the human race, and he's one-upping it because now he is the Adam. He's the, he, I call him the, uh, the rectification of the human condition. And uh, so it's, 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 the, the gospel is asked so much more magnificent than we could even imagine. And, and it's so magnif magnificent, it's, it's, it's so awe-inspiring that even the angels are looking down and, and, and awestruck at what God is doing with the human race. And, and, and we so belittle that, that situation, I think. You know, we so belittle the, the, the fact um, that Steve was alluding to, that God made man in his image. I mean, this was something unique. This was something fantastic that was happening for the first time. And you can imagine, after the, the, the uh, uh, pre-Adamic world and the destruction of this great, probably very great and high civilization comes to ruin and then God resets everything and creates us, our race, the human race, our father Adam. And uh, that, that right there should, just, should give you uh, an understanding of why there is so much animosity towards human beings. And let me tell you something. We are the most, besides Jesus, uh, we are the most hated entities in the universe. We are the human race. And, 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 and there are more than just, by the way, there are more than just angels, demons, and humans. You know, those are three, uh, in terms of angels and demons, like Steve was saying, there's a big difference between angels and demons. But between angels and demons, you have a whole spectrum of creatures. And I'm not talking about animals. I'm talking about sentient creatures, entities that are malevolent, that are in league with the devil that absolutely hate us. And in most cases, these entities are uh, far smarter than we are. They have far more knowledge than we do. But you know what? They, they, have, they cannot partake in what, in what the Bible calls, and uh, what Paul calls the fellowship of the mystery, the, 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 the redemption in Jesus Christ through the cross. They, they cannot partake of that. And believe me, they're seething with jealousy and envy and anger against the human race. And that right there explains uh, so much of what goes on um, in, you know, in abduction scenarios and stuff. There's just an absolute contempt for our race, for the human race, because of how much God loves us and because of what he was willing to do to redeem us. And one thing that really makes me angry is, is uh, when people belittle the gospel 
And, you know, there's a lot, you know, obviously the big mega churches and stuff, it's all about unity and this and that and love. But, but, but they, they take the focus off the most astounding thing in the universe, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, um, and so anyways, uh, 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 actually, a lot of this, the sentiment that I'm, um, that a lot of it comes from having just got done reading, actually in the last chapter of Earth's Earliest Ages. I mean, it really, really stirred me up. And, uh, you know, it'll stir, it'll, if you haven't read it yet, it'll stir you up um, when you read this book. But, uh, you know, I'll pass it back to you before we get into the uh, anti yeah. stuff. Uh, it, it, Tim and Steve, if I can just interject something here. I have a copy of Earth, Earth's Earliest Ages by George H. Pember. Uh, also, Steve, I did put up the uh, Sumerian Kings tablets. It's a, uh, if you go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, it's a top story. It's got a photograph of the tablets um, that uh, you were speaking of earlier. But I've, I've got to, I, I just want to mention this. I think it's important as we were talking, as you were talking, Steve and, and Tim, there was a destruction, it would appear, and, and based on uh, uh, my readings of, of Ember's work, my readings of Steve Quayle's work, uh, in my mind, unmatched by anyone, it, along with Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. If you combine what what they're saying, uh, there was a destruction within our solar system when the angels fell. That was the first destruction, and and then of course we had the first flood, then Noah's flood, and of course behind all of the destruction, well we got Satan who was a destroyer from the beginning. Those that be, that came before Adam and Eve, before God's, uh, be before before the uh, uh, before man, before God's seed, of course, were were not human. They were humanoid, perhaps, but 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 not human. Steve, is that an accurate assessment? Right, and and I think the thing that, uh, you know, prior creation, whether it was cities of angels or it was prior creations, the fascinating thing is and when you get into, and again, Doug, I, I sound like an old guy on this. By the way, somebody, it was funny, some guy uh, told my friend Bob that uh, he said, Quail's losing his edge, he's getting, an, getting to be an old guy. I laughed and I told Bob, I said, that's like a sledgehammer telling a razor blade that, uh, you know, he's got the edge. I, I, it's funny, I only bring that up to say this, by the grace of God, he's always kept me on the edge. And he told me one time, I'll just share this with people, uh, you know, when Harold Bradison was alive, he took me up to a cliff. I think I've shared this before. And it was up in an old mine out of San Diego. And when we were walking up, this is, this is relevant, okay? When, he, when we were walking up there, I kept looking around because I knew there were angels. I didn't see them, but I sensed them. And if you knew Harold, he's, he's the guy that led Pat Boone to the Lord and, and brought a lot of people into uh, the fullness of the Holy Ghost. Make a long story short, he stands me on the edge of a cliff. It was only like three or 400 feet down, and the first thing I thought was, oh, I probably said a word I shouldn't have. I'm, he's going to see if I have faith. And I was, I was basically thinking he was going to tell me to jump off the cliff and Jesus would save me. Well, I wouldn't have jumped off the cliff, but that's what I thought. Immediately, Harold broke into prophesying over me, and the Lord said, Steve, do you see those people down there? And you could see San Diego off. He said, they think they're safer down there without me than you are on the cliff with me. And this is cool. I guess this is the word of the Lord that's come to pass. He said, I'll always have you on the edge of a cliff in time, but he said, you'll never go over the cliff. And believe me, Doug, I've heard voices tell me to jump, and I'm talking off literal cliffs, you know. And uh, But it's a word of the Lord. So why that's relevant is that the safest place in the universe, I don't care what goes on. We come into the next hour, we'll talk about Emmanuel Velikovsky, Worlds in Collision, Astral Catastrophism, the late Donald Patton, and we'll go into this whole scenario of judgment. But the safest place tonight for everyone in the world is to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ while he may be found. Because the scripture in Acts says, In him, Jesus, we live and move and have our being. Everything I know, I know through the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, and by the teaching of godly men. And I subject everything to the scripture. Now, people can argue, but Tim said in a powerful statement earlier, the same spirit that caused the destruction of mankind in the garden 
and the billions of people lost are two spirits, jealousy and envy. That was in the heavenly realm. That has now transposed or transferred to the earthly realm. And every day, Doug, you can see the same thing playing out. Jealousy and envy. Jealousy says, I want what you have. Envy says, I will not let you live with what you have. This is the whole purpose behind transhumanism. It's a whole purpose behind Kurzweil and all these people that will not acknowledge the God of heaven, yet believe that with their intelligence and all that God has graced mankind with, even in the fall, that somehow they'll build a better human. And we can call them, uh, you know, whatever. You can call them... Uh, uh, the artelec, the the artificial man, you can call him, uh, oh, good night, homo noeticus, the new man. But at the end of a day, it all boils down to what Tim said earlier in the broadcast. It's all based on jealousy and envy at the hands of the evil one, Satan and his minions. Amen, brother. Uh, well said. Folks, you're listening to a very special Tuesday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. It is the 29th day of July 2014. I'm Doug Hagman. With me is Joe Hagman. Our very special guest, Mr. Steve Quayle, stevequayle.com. And, and folks, visit that website. If you don't have the book, Genesis 6 Giants, definitely grab it. It's also available, compliments of Timothy Alberino in Spanish. Visit uh, the Alberino analysis via stevequayle.com. He's also our guest on the program tonight. We're going to be right back. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Tuesday, July 29, 2014, with a very special guest, Steve Quayle from stevequayle.com and Mr. Timothy Alberino. Uh, it's been a tremendous first hour. I'm just going to hand it right back over to you, Steve, and we'll get into hour number two. Well, i got to tell you, this is a powerful show. And, again, Timothy Alberino does the Alberino analysis on my uh, website. And um, we're going to be kicking that into a, a more, um, oh, good night, frequent situation. Tim's got about the best handle. I'm not flattering him, but he's been gifted and graced by the living God. And it's so refreshing because, you know, his knowledge base is, is absolutely uh, astonishing from practical in the jungles of Peru. So uh, I had the privilege of introducing him at the Whitestone Conference, which you, you'll see a couple minutes of it. And so we're working right now on a project on an expedition unlike any other in the history of the world with no bragging, no bravado, and no, uh, you know, uh, sensationalism. His efforts, my efforts, the efforts of a whole lot of people combined uh, to bring about, I think, uh, something that God will want released in his time. And, uh, you know, we, basically right now we're out uh, doing what we got to do to raise the funds to launch the expedition. We're not na like National Geographic and can just get on a jet and jet off to the most arcane places in the world. But the point is, is that there's so much red tape in so many places, and we're asking God to uh, expedite the release of... Uh, sites and different people and it's interesting because you know most people uh, approach this from a historic or a, yeah or just oh, some uh, intellectual or archaeological or an antiquarian viewpoint we approach this from the kingdom of god where the lord said there's nothing that's been hidden that won't be made known or be revealed and i want to get right now to back into the subject i'll turn it over to tim the, cat, the catastrophism, from which we get the word catastrophe, Velikovsky, who was not a Christian, by the way, Emmanuel Velikovsky, talked specifically about worlds in collision. And what was fascinating about that is the very fact that whether you've got meteors or you've got uh, specific meteor belts, you've got the situation of Rahab, of literally the planet Rahab being destroyed, you've got the admonition in Ezekiel 28 that uh, uh, Lucifer was in the garden of God, and that would be a pre-Adamic Eden, and it's fascinating that getting kicked out of the pre-Adamic Eden, i.e. Jeremiah's first flood, then uh, showing up in the second Eden to tempt uh, to tempt Eve and obviously be successful, it's fascinating again that the catastrophes that have happened throughout the universe, it's, it's astonishing that God has given us so much. You can look at the moon and see the craters on it. You can go to Crater Lake in Oregon and see the crater. You can go to the craters in, of, of the moon and the different places where the craters have been, whether they're underwater or on 
the surface of the earth. And by the way, just as the, the scientists were being murdered, the bioweapon scientists that I've documented for the last 10 years, Doug and Joe, they've also been whacking the astronomers and especially when it came to any of the planets that the ancients said would be coming back. And I think it's fascinating whether you call it Nibiru, you call it Planet X, you call it Gabriel's Fist, you call it Lucifer's Hammer. There's so many names uh, associated with it. But what the one thing people forget, in the Old Testament, the penalty for sin and rebellion against God was stoning. Isn't it fascinating that that which is in heaven came to that which is in earth? And the cast you down literally means when, let's see, Revelation 12, 12, where is talking about being cast down like a stone in anger. So it's fascinating that we reject the stone, the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ, yet the world is hell-bent, and I use that word in its fullest expression, to embrace the destroyer of worlds. And this is what we're talking about tonight. This is why it's so important. I can tell you this, and this is not a bragging statement, that it's possible to talk for 12 hours straight on two words, tohu and bohu. It's possible to talk about how many times they appear in the Old Testament. It's possible to talk about the derivation of those and how they're only used. The word plenish, there's, there's replenish and plenish. Uh, there's the word barah for uh, create, you know, versus other words for restore or rebuild. So they're, 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 we can't go into all that stuff tonight. But what we can go into is if you look at the greatest monoliths, if you look at the greatest structures, whether it's a preg the stone of the pregnant woman in Baalbek, B-A-A-L-B-E-K, whether it's some of the, the uh, uh, massive stones that are under the pyramids. You know, one thing that I learned a long time ago from my time, Doug, that you are familiar with, with my uh, stint being associated with some pretty powerful men and women for a number of years, is that they always taught me one thing. They taught me never look at what's at the surface. Look at what's underneath. Every single thing you see standing now, whether it's the Pyramids of Giza on the Giza Plateau, whether it's uh, Angkor Wat, whether it's the great temples of India, whether it's the greatest citadels in the history of the world, or Cappadocia, everything is built on something that once was. It can be due to energy sources. It can be due to ley lines. And this isn't New Age nonsense. This is the very physics of creation. And so it's impossible to try and explain this in a short time. And by the way, if we brought Wayne on to explain torsion physics and the interaction uh, of energy fields, trust me, we'd all be going, oh, Lord, help us all. Uh, that's a compliment to Wayne and uh, a necessity for us to pray more. But, Tim, go ahead and share, if you would, just as you were, you know, you can give a little bit of a clue. I mean, when you look at the greatest rock work and stone quarry work in the world. You can go on Ancient Aliens and see that no one can explain it. Yet we know from history that that the giants overcame gravity, obviously, by, you know, magnetic or harmonic levitation. I'm not talking about spiritual levitation. I'm talking about a harmonic that changes the mass. You want to deal with some of your findings and some of the mind-blowing stuff you're working on just in different parts of the world? And this is so yeah. important. Uh, I'm sorry, Tim, I didn't mean to interrupt, but okay. folks, please listen to this. This is so important because, Steve, I, it, what you just uh, stated, this is what uh, this is all about, what life, what this life is all about, what this life force is all about. Uh, go ahead, Tim. I just, just want to stress the importance of what you're about to say. Before I forget to mention it, I want, I want to, uh, to announce to any – any of the listeners who are Spanish-speaking or who have Spanish-speaking relatives, that the book Angels, um, the book um, uh, Aliens and Fallen Angels is completely translated in Spanish and available on Steve's website. The book Genesis 6 Giants is almost done being translated. That's about, we're about halfway done with that. Um, you can expect that to come out in Spanish uh, shortly. You can also get a link to, to buy the book on the uh, Spanish the Spanish website of uh, Genesis 6 Giants, which is gigantesdegenesis.com. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure we – I said that before I forgot. Yeah, so, um, you know, there, there's something that, uh, that, the, that the Lord was taught me when I began to uh, – when, when I began to go down the rabbit hole, let's say, uh, of all of this. Um, 
there's a phrase that the Lord put into my head because I couldn't grapple with a lot of this. You know, there's something about us, especially Christians, um, and I find this to be true. Sometimes we have a, and this is true of generally of human beings, um, we have a, a, not only are we comfortable with our world paradigm, we're, we're arrogant about our world paradigm, and we don't like to admit that there might be things happening that we don't know about, that we're not informed on. It's very difficult to, to lift your hands up and say, in the beginning, and say, I was clueless about that, or I was completely in the dark, or I was deceived. Um, it's very difficult for us to do that, and, and I watch that, uh, that process. People go through that painful process because you have to go back and rethink a lot of what you think you know. You know, there's that famous uh, uh, um, exposition that the late Lloyd Pye used to do, everything you think you know is wrong. And that's, I mean, that's almost true when you go back and take a second look at all of this. Everything you thought, everything you, thought you knew turns out to be wrong or at least uh, distorted on some level. So, so the Lord told me one time, as I was just getting my mind blown, getting into a lot of this stuff, he said, you were born into the world, not with it. And that's just a, it's a very simple statement, but if you think about it, uh, it, 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 it says a million things at once. We were born into this world. We're latecomers to the planet. I mean, there, 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 has, there is so much history behind us. I mean, there's not only human history. There is, you were talking about the pre pandemic stuff. There is so much history. Who knows how many years, thousands or millions or possibly even billions of years behind us. You know, there, I mean, it's hard for us to, to admit, but there once existed a time, obviously, when the human race was not around. And we have a very, uh, uh, obviously, as human beings, we have a very human-centric paradigm not only on the planet Earth, but on the universe. And, and, of course, people would say, well, obviously, we're human beings. But think about how erroneous that is, to have a human-centric paradigm of a planet we just showed up on 6,000 years ago. Uh, you know, and so that's part of the problem. People have to break out of this box and understand that we were born into a situation, not only a situation of things that are going on on planet Earth that have been in the works for years and years and years, but we're also born into a condition. The Bible, obviously, this is the condition of sin and the fall of man. I mean, we're born into this situation. So we're born into a fallen condition and, and, and need of redemption, and we're born into, the, into a world that has been undergoing such turmoil and, and uh, such profound uh, change over the centuries. And, 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 I mean, I shouldn't say over the centuries. I should say over the eons. So we're born into the world, not with it. And I, and I said, you know, we have a very humanistic uh, paradigm of, of, of the world, and so we, we, we can't understand a lot of stuff. Uh, obviously, we should have a, a Christ-centric paradigm. That's how we ought to view the universe, not from a humanistic paradigm, but we ought to view it as a Christ-centric. We ought to have a Christ-centric paradigm. Jesus Christ is at the center of everything. It all exists for him. He is the reason. You know, there's that... That 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 uh, there was that uh, cliche Christian saying. Uh, my mom used to actually hang up stuff on the windows, and you know, around Easter time or Christmas, Jesus is the reason for the season. And yes, that's absolutely true. But man, Jesus is the reason for the universe. He's the reason for everything. I mean, it, 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 he is the center. He's the singularity. And um, and so. Uh, we need to get away from the humanistic paradigm because if you have a humanistic paradigm and, and everything uh, that you consider, everything that you, that you uh, your, your point of view of the planet, of the solar system, of the universe, if it's humanistic, it's going to be based in great ignorance because obviously there are entities, both angelic and other entities, that have been around a lot longer than we have, as Steve was saying. I mean, just imagine the intelligence of these beings, and I'm not praising these beings, I'm just making, I'm just pointing out a fact, I'm making a true statement. These entities are so, uh, I mean, you talk about physics and mathematics, you think that these guys don't know about all of this stuff? I mean, people can't get over the fact, for example, and I'm probably rambling here, but people can't get over the fact, for example, that, that angels would have knowledge about technology. You know, and I'll admit, I'll admit, that was actually a stumbling block for me in the beginning because I had this Sunday school uh, perception of, of the world, 
and of Christianity and you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the biblical events, I, I couldn't factor, I couldn't, I couldn't quantify, uh, you know, technology and, and what it really was and, and angels and all this different stuff, and it's just so foreign because we're not, taught, we're not taught that we're born into the world not with it. I mean, obviously we all know that, but that's not our perspective. We show up on the scene, turn on Fox News, and think we know everything about the world. And, man, we don't know nothing. When you start, when you start delving into this stuff, um, I mean, uh, it, it is, it's so profound. So we're dealing with entities. We could be dealing with entities, by the way, uh, that are from the pre-Adamic world. And there, there, there's no, there's, I think it's logical to infer that if there are entities that exist, and I'm not even talking about angelic entities. I think that's a given. Obviously, they were there. But other entities that might not necessarily be angels, but other, who knows what they are. Maybe, maybe entities that were created, by God in the beginning, and they also fell in the rebellion of Satan. I'm sure that if, if Satan is able to deceive angels, if Satan is able to deceive angels on the levels of uh, on the level of of, of the of the fallen angels, whatever level they're on, watchers or whatever they are, then certainly he's able to deceive other kinds of entities as well. Because there's not just angels in heaven, and we know that biblically because, of course, we have the the uh, the creatures around the throne. We have seraphim. We have all these different uh, entities that are named in the Bible. Uh, angelic entities and spiritual entities. Uh, I personally believe that the, that the universe is teeming with uh, entities that God created, not necessarily aliens on other planets, but just in the heavenlies, um, all different kinds of stuff, because the earth is but a shadow of a greater reality. And if God, when creating the earth, created, you know, myriads of different kinds of creatures on the earth, how much more so in the, in, in the heavenly realm, if the earth is but a shadow of greater things? So we have to get that through our head. It's very important. It may seem like a, a nominal a point, but I think it's very important in order to understand the times in which we're coming, which we're, which we're presently in, and the days that are coming ahead, that it's not just about humans, demons, humans, uh, uh, devils, angels, and God, but that there's a whole host of entities that factor into everything that's happening. So it, one of the very intriguing things that I, that I, that I often think about is, is were there other, and when I say entities, let's, let's say, you know, alien-like entities, not that they come from other planets, but let's say in a pre-Adamic world, sentient beings of some kind that were, that, that, that were with the angels or whatever, or below them on the hierarchy or something like that. Is it possible that some of those entities are still around today? and that somehow they escaped the first cataclysm. Of course, this is a postulation, but that they escaped the first cataclysm. Maybe they got off world. Uh, maybe they went under. I don't know. But what happens is uh, when you begin to understand, when you begin to get away from having a humanistic paradigm, humanistic perspective of the earth and of the universe, especially when you start to align yourself with, with, the, with the Word of God and have a Christ-centric perspective that everything's revolving around Him, everything's revolving around the Gospel. I mean, everything that's happening on the earth is happening because of one reason. The Lord Jesus Christ is returning at some point in time to rule and reign. That is the catalyzing thing that's causing everything to, all the pieces and parts to move. I mean, that's the thing that's got the devil shaking in his boots every day is that at some point in time, the Son of God is coming back to this planet. He's not just coming back to take us away somewhere. He's coming back to rule and reign, and he'll dash the nations uh, with an with a iron rod like pottery. And, uh, and obviously all these entities know that this event is coming. And uh, so, so we have this situation where there's, there's, there's more than just humans, that's one of the most important things for us to understand in the days in which we live, because there is Tim, a deception. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, no, no uh, Tim, I didn't mean to take you off stride, but I just wanted to, to reinforce the fact that we are being told so many lies today. Lucifer is pushing this agenda to be accepted as God, of course, of, of course, on earth. And uh, one of the ways, and, and, and I'm beginning emails saying this is the most important program people have ever heard, but uh, the fact of the matter is what is being created is the foundation for the biggest deception that has ever been perpetuated on mankind. That's right. They want us to believe that mankind is a creation of, of these of foreign aliens, for example, that they are our gods, and uh, therefore there is no real God. It's them, and the Bible will be at some point 
discredited, and it will be proclaimed that there are no such things as, uh, well, for example, natural God-given rights, but the fact is, this is the deception, folks. This is, and so, uh, Tim, keep going. I'm sorry. I just wanted to verify or just to reinforce that. No, that's a fantastic point, Doug. That's, that's exactly what this is all heading towards, is deception. And listen, when I say, listen, I am a person who is uniquely acquainted with deception. Believe me when I say that. I can't get into why I, I'm saying that. But I, uh, I, I am deeply and very intimately acquainted with deception. Deception isn't just believing something that's false. Deception is a power. It saturates your being. It completely blinds you to the truth. And uh, deception is, you know, it's, again, it's not just believing in something that isn't true. It is a power. It is a tangible power. And there is a deception uh, uh, you know, Jesus warned us of this. The apostles warned us of this. There is a deception coming to mankind, the likes of which has never been on this planet. Jesus said that we're coming into times that, uh, that there's going to be times such as never have been, ever, and never will be again. I mean, and if we're the people who are living in that time, if we are the generation alive in the day of this deception, man, we have better wake up. Because if we think that just run-of-the-mill traditional Sunday school teachings are going to prepare us for this deception, we're wrong. We have got to be so grounded in cord and intimacy with Jesus Christ, and we have to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, because the deception is going to be a counterfeit of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what the deception is going to be about, it's that. It will be a counterfeit of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the man of sin appears, you know, it, 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 I often tell people, don't, you know, don't be baking on the end times unfolding like the Left Behind books or like the Left Behind movies because they're not calculating. Listen, so many believers are not calculating these other entities that exist and that are in the mix. They're not calculating Genesis 6. They're not calculating the Nephilim. They're not calculating the pre-Adamic world. They think it's just going to be some great political leader who shows up on the scene and coalesces power you know, at some central point in some, some world government. And, yes, that's going to be an element, but, man, you've got to understand genetics. You've got to understand Genesis 6. You've, and, and, of course, you have to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people think, oh, we do understand the gospel. You know, we, we understand that Jesus uh, came, to the, you know, came to die for our sins. And, you know, how many droves of so-called Christians proclaim that they are uh, followers of Jesus Christ, but, uh, but ultimately they're uh, universalists, and they're being swept into ecumenicalism, and they're being swept into a line. They can't even see what's coming because they have no grid. They have no reference. They've been ignoring and, and in, in many cases, rejecting any notion of a pre-Adamic world, any notion of the Genesis 6 uh, uh, angels having intercourse with humans, producing these human, non-human entities, and, and, you know, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the, sunning of, of the coming of the Son of Man. Man, if we are that generation, you know, uh, we've got some, we, we've got, even those of us who are, who are woke enough to agree, we've got a lot more waking up to do still, you know, because, like I said, there's no, there, there, there's no, uh, it's, it, it's unfathomable what's happening. And I think that's a great word. Listen. You know, you can try and understand, uh, and you can get a, a, a good idea of some things. You can try and understand the, the Illuminati, what are the Illuminati doing? You can try and understand the alien agenda. You can try and understand, you know, the, the New World Order. You can try and understand Agenda 21. You can try and understand, you know, the Rothschilds and the banking system and eugenics. And you can have a good hold on all of these issues. But let me tell you something. If you do not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know nothing. You know nothing if you do not get the gospel because the deception and the lie is going to be is going to hinge on the gospel. It is a counterfeit that is revolving around the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. It's all about the gospel. It's all about Jesus is coming back to the earth and, and the devil is setting the stage. Ultimately God's setting the stage for all of this, but but the devil is setting the stage even now for the man of sin to come. And I personally believe that this man of sin isn't going to show up on the scene alone. And I know he's not going to be fully human. Let's just put it that way. And, 
and so there's something coming, and Steve was alluding to it in the beginning with the, with the Vatican, and, the, and they're, they're expecting the, the, the alien saviors to come, and, you know, they've made all these ridiculous statements, how they, they baptize an alien and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, they, 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 not, they are coming. And when I say they, I'm not talking about some, some kooky idea of Martians, you know, or something like that with the big helmets and your traditional. They are coming, and when they come, they are coming to usher humanity into a new era, humanity 2.0. They're, they're coming to usher us in to, it's, it's the lie in the Garden of Eden, you shall be as gods. I mean, it's the first lie is the last lie. The, that, was the, that was the very first thing that caused, you know, the mother of our race to, to, to fall and, 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 to, and to give in to the temptation because if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God or you'll be like God. You know, you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. And it's that dried, it, 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 that's the hook in our mouth. That's the hook in humanity's mouth. You can transcend. You can become like God. And let me tell you something. When they show up on the scene and offer us the, the tangible, uh, let's just call them technologies or whatever, to allow us to become more than human, that's when the game is really going to start to accelerate. Because let me guarantee you something for all the listeners. They are coming and the antichrist is coming the son of perdition is coming and when he comes believe me it's not going to be like you expect that's not a very good deception the deception is so powerful it's going to catch people off guard and it's not even on the radar for most believers what this deception is going to look like i know that because like i said i'm intimately acquainted with deception and i was at one point totally and utterly deceived to the point where it saturated my being and, um, you know, I'll kick it back to you at this point, Steve. Well, Doug, do you want to say something before I go into Ezekiel 28? Again, here's what I want to share with people. The word of the Lord, I love what, what so many people used to teach in the early 70s with the Jesus movement where I got saved and so many of you other, uh, my contemporaries got saved. There was a love for Jesus that stayed with us, that motivated us, that directed us, that guided us, that provided for us. And and the thing that I'm saying is the people that I know today that fell in love with Jesus then are still walking with the Lord. They've had, you know, a lot of uh, bad, a lot of evil happen in their lives, but there's something about that name Jesus. And when you go to Ezekiel 28, I've asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I have a finite mind. Obviously, I can only understand what you enable me to understand. But, God, I, I want to understand the nature of the war. I want to be able to articulate your to your people how amazing your grace is. I love amazing grace. I, I tell people, Doug, that song I know who it was written for, I knew who it was written about, but that should be every single one of our theme songs. But I want to take people to the word of the Lord. And before anybody gripes, complains, or uses the other word, they should take the time to look this up and to pray over it, okay? Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Lucifer is called the shining one. Thou ha- Now here's the critical part. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou was created. Lucifer was created. Jesus was begotten. There's a difference. God took stuff. And, and and created uh, uh, Lucifer, God took of his own heart and brought forth Jesus. That's the way the Lord explained to me. Pray about it. You are the anointed cherub that covers. Now, Lucifer is not an angel. He is a cherub. Cherubs and seraphim are of a higher order than the angels. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Stones of fire is a is an idiom for the planets. In other words, the the the, the planets were your stepping stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created, till iniquity was found in thee. God did not create the iniquity. Lucifer allowed it to come in because of his pride in his beauty. 
This is why, if everybody wants to know why, uh, um, oh, good night, Aleister Crowley and everyone embraced rock and roll music, so even David Bowie made the famous statement, everyone knows that rock and roll is the devil's music, it's because the seduction of music is unlike any other, because with music, music has the ability to change matter. I can't go into all the details. It has the ability to, to basically open stargates and close stargates, specific frequencies. I don't know which ones. I'm working on that right now. The point is, will, hint, hint, hint. The bottom line is is that we're, we're at a time now where Lucifer and the fallen angels will present their alien savior as a glowing figure. And thou was perfect in thy ways, verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 15, Boy, my eyes are... Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Now listen to this. By the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. There's Velikovsky, world in collision. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I bring forth the fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of them that behold thee. That's what Tim is talking about. People can, can be deceived. People can be uh, enjoined to the purpose and power of Lucifer. They can be persuaded to do that which is evil in the Lord. But one thing that Lucifer knows, he knows the word of God. And that's why I put up for today, Doug, uh, Joe, and, and uh, Tim on my website, Revelation 12.12. 12. And I think people forget about that. I want to make the differentiation. There's a difference between the wrath of the devil against God's people and the wrath of God on one day against the devil's people. The point is, is that it's true. The Scripture says we have not been appointed to God's wrath. That falls on the unbeliever. But woe unto you inhabitants here. I think woe is one of the best three-letter words I know in the Bible. Actually, I prefer it to the four-letter words I would just soon not use, okay? But woe, woe, woe is probably one of the, the most powerful three-letter words in the world. Because when God starts saying woe, the angels start saying woe, or Jesus himself says woe, you better understand that means something's going to happen. So as Tim was explaining, the alien deception will be so great. By the way, again, that was Ezekiel 28, uh, starting with verse 12, going through, I think, uh, uh, verse 19. Very important word. It starts out in the first part of uh, uh, Ezekiel 28, talking about the earthly king of Tyrus, who was very profane, then switches into the uh, supernatural. And all that stuff, the Eden, the Garden of God, hey, guess what? The devil wanted back into what God basically destroyed him from. And what was it? What was it? Here's the thing that most Christians miss. Now I'm getting excited, Tim. Now I'm getting excited. What was it that the devil couldn't have, that he was even going back to the Garden of Eden to try and destroy the creation? He lost his access to the Lord. Who walked in the garden with Adam and Eve? You guys getting this? This is instant revelation time. He walked with the Lord. Yep. You see? And yep. and the devil wanted by his efforts to get back to that place he could never have. As we as human beings have sinned, as we as human beings have been deceived, misled, as we kill, as we slaughter, as we do everything that we ought or not are, the point is, and I know that's not the correct language, I'm just doing a, a, a poor attempt at rhyming, the point is, is that this is the majesty of our Redeemer. This is the majesty of the Son of God. This is the majesty of the King of glory. This is the majesty of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the name of he who every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the fact that he would call us friends, believe me, the devil knows. And even in the book of Enoch, which we'll maybe get to in the next hour or so, the point being, the book of Enoch, God even tells Enoch, Enoch, you're not the one to be praying for them. They should have been praying for you. But because Enoch was a righteous scribe, and ladies and gentlemen, on my website, and it's on Tim's website, when I say Tim, Tim is the sister site, and I, Tim, how do you say 
uh, Genesis 6 Giants in Spanish. I apologize. How do you say that? The website is Gigantes de Genesis 6. Okay. Yeah, so the Genesis 6 Giants website, is, is there, it's not totally the same, but in that there's the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants. These are Dead Sea Scrolls, Doug, and 99% of the Christians that give me uh, an irritation do not go there to even leave. Yet the, the same Dead Sea Scrolls that validated the Book of Isaiah with fragments of Isaiah and Jeremiah. These are the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Book of Giants really says that the fallen angels went after everything. They corrupted every single thing. And in Scripture, this is something that we've got to get, Tim, right clear to everyone. Jesus said in heaven they are neither given or taken in marriage, but are as the angels of heaven. When people are asking them, you know, whose wife will this lady be if she's been married to two guys in, in the earth and then goes to heaven? He said, you don't get it. But the angels didn't keep their first estate. They basically injected, and you, let's just put it in the pure sexual sense, they injected their, their, they were able to take on themselves the functionality of human beings in the procreative process. I'm being delicate here, guys. And, and with that same energy that they possess, the life energy as angels, even in their fallen state, they were able to energize the seed of the earth women and produce the mighty men and women of renown. There are no, once again, fallen angel women, but there were female gigant, uh, giantesses. And the, the interesting thing is, is that uh, uh, the whole world of homosexuality, when I deal with the antiquity of it, guess what? Diodorus made this statement, even though there were pretty giant women, the giant men preferred the comfort of each other sexually. I'm sorry, that may sound a little base, but where do you think all these habits come into the human genome, you know? Where do you think they entered in? You see, this is the thing that people don't understand, how great our redemption is. Because we don't really have the fullest understanding, as Tim was saying, just how far mankind fell. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, and uh, uh, going back to Timber's book, Earth's Earliest Ages, you know, he transitions from the, uh, pre um, the pre-Adamic world to the pre-flood world, the antediluvian world. There is a connection, a strategic connection, and it's important for us to begin to understand. I'm not saying we're going to begin to understand it right now, but to begin to uh, pray about and search out the connection that between, and there's many, but, but there's something so vital between the, the, the pre-Adamic world, the pre-flood world, and the times in which we're living right now. There's a thread that if you follow the thread back, you're going to start to discover some very interesting things. And uh, uh, I want to uh, make a couple comments on the, on the antediluvian world, the pre-flood world. Um, you know, so we're talking about the pre-Adamic world. I want to talk for a minute about the pre-flood world, the world, you know, between Adam and, uh, and Noah but before the flood. There are some misconceptions that we have about the pre-flood world. And because we have these misconceptions about the pre-flood world, it has, it has sabotaged our understanding about the times in which we live. And isn't that cunning of the devil? If the days of, at the end are going to be like the days of Noah, wouldn't it be a wise strategy by the devil to completely confuse and, um, and, and make the days of Noah a very uh, touchy and controversial subject so that, so that believers kind of push away from it, or they have a, or they have a real cheesy... Uh, Sunday school notion of what the days of Noah were. That would be a, an, an amazing strategy to keep us in the dark. But if you understand what was really going on in the days of Noah, the, the pre-flood world, uh, it, we have to get a, gri a grip on this because it, it wasn't just like he was talking about the, the, the Noah movie which came out, you know, like that Noah movie show, it's just sandal-clad people walking around like, you know, just one step up from barbarians or cavemen. No. There was technology in the pre in the in the uh, antediluvian, the pre-flood world. Now, listen, these entities that were created from the uh, from the copulation of angels with, with with human women, these entities that proceeded forth that 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 were born of these women, were not fully human and they were not fully angelic. The Book of Enoch says that their that their nature was primarily angelic, but they were also partly human. So they were part human. Part angel, part watcher, whatever you know, whatever hierarchy those those angels were in. So what does that mean? Are you going to get just a gigantic human being walking around like you see in cartoons with a big club on its shoulders and stupid? 
No, you're going to get a being that may very well have been partly interdimensional, a being that, that could have accessed these uh, stargates that Steve talked about and, and would have been far more intelligent than the human race. In fact, according to the Book of Enoch, the, the human race, these guys were dominating the earth to such a degree that the occupation of the human race at some point in time became to feed them, just to feed them. And then, of course, they began to eat the human. But basically, we're talking about a, a situation on this planet, on planet Earth, a pre-flood situation that looks vastly different than most people would have ever imagined. For one thing, when I, I never had the notion that growing up, I, I, I was never led to understand that the, pre, that the pre-flood world was heavily populated. But there's a lot of great studies that have been done that show that most likely the population of the antediluvian world, it was in the billions. Not just 100,000 or 200,000 or 300,000, like, I, I, and I call it a Sunday school mentality. It was, a, it was a population in the billions. And these were, uh, remember, the ground was cursed, too. So, I mean, this was a very difficult situation for humanity. Plus, you have these beings coming down, you know, the gods of old. There's all these different civilizations and all these different ancient religions all talk about the, 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 uh, the offspring of the gods, the sons of the gods that came uh, of the uh, union of, 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 the God, of, of the gods with women. Obviously, we know that as the fallen angels with, of these watchers with the human race, with human women. And so, the, so the, these giants were ruling the earth. And by the way, there's two, th- there's two reasons that were given um, in the Book of Enoch why these, uh, why these angelic beings fell in the first place. They're, they're two very simple things to understand. It's not some complicated... Uh, you know, something that we can't understand. Two things. Lust. They were lustful after these women, and I know that's hard for people to, to, to grasp, but they were lustful. Even Paul alludes in the New Testament that when women pray, that when women pray, he said they should cover their heads for the sake of the angels. So obviously there's some kind of a dynamic going on there where angels look down and they, if, if their hearts are foul, if their hearts are turning from God, they can lust over the women. That's just the way it is. So, uh, so the lust, and then the second thing is they wanted to have offspring. They wanted to have offspring. They wanted to produce children. So they, they were less of the women, but they wanted to have children. Now, why would they want to have children? What would be the driving factor for these angelic beings to have children? Well, you can imagine that, you know, once these beings came into existence, they were the dominant force on planet Earth. I mean, these guys were massive, and you know, in Genesis six giants, he's got a, a scale there that shows that shows one of the one of the skeletons that was found. I think uh, it was thirty six inch. It was thirty six feet tall, right, Steve? In the in the scale in your book. Yes. I mean, that's, yep. that's a that's a massive, massive being. I mean, you look like a Barbie doll in that thing, can. Uh, and that's a, that was bones that were found, thirty six feet tall. So these entities were vastly more intelligent. They were more supernatural in, in, in terms of the dynamic interacting with different dimensions, stargates, because they were part angel. They weren't fully human like us. They were part angel. So they, were, they had the capacity of angels. They had the faculties of some of the faculties of angels and some of the faculties of humans. I mean, these were super beings. These, you know, no wonder why the people worship them. Obviously, they're nothing in comparison, in comparison to the Son of God. But the, but, but the people at the time began to turn away from the Lord and went after these entities, worshiping them, not only worshiping them, but worshiping the power behind their throne, their parents. You know, and that's one of the reasons I believe that these fallen angels wanted to have offspring, because they were the power behind the throne. These, their children were ruling the planet. At one point in time, there is no question about what I'm about to say. This is absolute fact. At one point in time, there was a global civilization. This is, this, this is, the fact that this is borne out in all of the structures that are, uh, that are so similar, all of the, the, the way that they built, I'm talking about the megalithic structures, there's pyramids on every continent. You know, that was one of the things that, that, that was just like a, 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 one of the most astounding things to, for me to learn. There are pyramids on every continent. We, we all know about the Great Pyramids, and we're told falsely that the Egyptians built the Great Pyramid of Giza. But there are pyramids on every continent. There's pyramids in China, which the Chinese government is, is trying to cover up. They're even planting trees on these things to make it look like they're not there. 
They're pyramids. Some of these pyramids are as big or bigger than the, than the ones in Egypt. I mean, there was a global civilization. It wasn't a bunch of guys walking around wearing animal skins and sandals. There was high technology, not only in the pre-Adamic world, but also in the pre-flood world, because these guys, were, these guys were vastly superior to us in intellect. The fallen angels were teaching the human race to do all kinds of forbidden stuff. They were teaching the human race forbidden knowledge. And, you know, you, you could go through the whole list of everything they were teaching, but let's just call it forbidden knowledge for the sake of time. They were teaching the human race to do things, a lot of the things that we're just now beginning to recover. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. That's not some kind of uh, metaphoric phrase. That is literal. We think we're so high and mighty because of our technology. Listen, we have inferior technology compared to what they had, both in the pre-Adamic world and in, the, and in the antediluvian world. These guys were building structures that we can't even figure out how they did it to this day. You know, we got, we got the Internet and Google and smartphones, but these guys were, were using forms of um, her, um, levitation and all kinds of stuff, uh, the electricity that we don't even know about yet. They were flying around in vehicles, you know. You, you talk about these, these ancient uh, uh, civilizations like Atlantis, Lemuria, uh, Shambhala, the Osirian Empire, these, these, these uh, uh, what people say are mythical um, uh, empires or cities or civilizations that once existed. They're not mythical. They really did exist. They existed at some point in time. Whether, whether some of these belong to the pre-Adamic world or to the antediluvian world, it, the point is they existed. There was technology, high technology. There's reason to believe, very strong reason to believe that they were able to, you know, get out into outer space and, and, and whatever. And, and so we have all of this stuff happening in the, in the antediluvian world. It was not a bunch of guys walking around, you know, like I said, just with sandals and, and, and animal skits and clubs. And besides the, besides the fallen angels, uh, besides the offspring of the fallen angels, remember that the human race, we have been genetically deteriorating since Adam. We're not evolving, we're devolving. We've been, we've been losing information. Our genome has been losing information. We are deteriorating genetically. We're not as strong as we once were. We're not as smart as we once were. The antediluvian human beings that existed, you know, in the times of Noah and, and, and before were far smarter and far more intelligent than we are. It's just, you know, I mean, they were closer to Adam. They were closer to the, to, to, to the, to the first man. And they had less degradation in their genome. They, genome. They, I'm sure they had more use of their brain and all kinds of stuff. We have got to get over the notion, this false notion that I think the devil has been so carefully sustaining in so many you know, uh, Christian circles that the antediluvian world was primitive. Get that out of your mind. The antediluvian world was not primitive. It, primitive. it was highly advanced. They, there's good reason to believe that they were flying around in sh spaceships, and when I say spaceships, I mean UFO type stuff. You know, you've got the Vimanas uh, um, from the, the Indian traditions, the, the, their flying machines, and you've got all kinds of, their, Atlantis was said to have had cigar shaped flying machines. That's interesting, cigar shaped flying machines. The Osirian Empire and, and, and the uh, Lemuria, the Lemurians were, were, were said to have had, been able to uh, fly around in saucer shaped craft. Does that sound familiar? Something's going on here. We're having a repeat of something happen in the days in which we live. But you would never understand that if you were just given to the notion that the antediluvian world was primitive. And I think that is such a, a powerful key for, your, for all of our minds to be unlocked, to, to understand that, there was, that there, were, there was a very large population, there was a global civilization, there was high technology, there were, man was not some primitive, primitive dummy, you know, walking around beating things over the head with a club. Man was very advanced in the antediluvian world. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be. And that's, that's why it is, you know, for those of us who begin to understand this and why it's so important to understand is because once some of these deceptive things start showing up, and they already are, we're not caught off guard. Not only are we not caught off guard, we're expecting them. We're expecting them, and believe me, that's, that's not what the devil, that's not the posture that the devil wants us to have about the days in which we live and the days which are coming. He doesn't want us to be expecting the, the antediluvian, the realities of the antediluvian world to begin to show up again, because we begin to then, you know, uh, be able to see into the deceptions that are beginning to emerge. 
Steve, and Steve, if I can, if I can interject this here, you know, we often talk as so cavalier-like about the new world order, about the the royal elite, the power elite. What uh, uh, what, what Tim is referring to here, I believe is the old world order coming through as the new world order. There's nothing new under the sun as 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 Tim said. Of course not. No. It's it's the old it's really the, the new old world order coming into play here. It's it's always been and it continues or well, it's it's back again, shall we say, or always been. And the fact is as I said earlier, this is in fact uh how the the why, the how, the methodology you know, as an investigator, uh, look at why, how, the, the, uh, uh, the motive, means, opportunity. This is how uh, they are creating the foundation for the biggest deception that's ever been perpetuated upon mankind. And and, and we are going to be led to believe that um, uh, through, whether it be through the Vatican or through through some religious uh, organizations or a combination thereof. Um, and this is what I'm getting out of what uh, what you and both what you've written and what Tim's uh, said in his YouTube's and has said tonight is the fact that um, um, we are going to be led to believe that uh, uh, they're coming as our saviors when in fact and, and in fact it could even work very well be they could say look uh, we're going to use DNA to prove uh, that, that your savior. Um, has always been here or is here now in the form of man or whatever and um um uh, uh essentially laying the groundwork for the antichrist is, is, does that make sense does that make sense Steve? Well, yeah yeah uh, you got it yeah and it's yes you have it Doug and and that's what uh, you know that's what Tom Horn and Chris Putnam pretty much look they're not making this stuff up i got a lot of, you know, a rattled Catholics saying, quit bashing Catholics. I said, I'm not bashing. You guys just need to listen to what the smartest, you know, uh, astronomers in your own uh, uh, church are saying. You know, first of all, that they're they're unveiling the, the Vatican secret plan for the arrival of an alien god. Those words, an alien god, are right out of the book of Daniel. Go ahead and, and Google it, ladies and gentlemen. Put alien god into a into a, um, oh, good night, a, a thesaurus and see what comes up or put it into Bible online. And, and you know, point being, Mount Graham and the whole Catholic uh, telescope and the Lucifer project, of all the names, why would you name it Lucifer? And that's an acronym for light, but it also has to do with who they're looking for. Do you remember, Doug, when Tom Horn made the statement that in the description of what they believe he, the coming one, will look like. Do you remember when he went into the whole description and you'd swear it was a a mid uh, a medieval uh, presentation of a gargoyle? Do you remember that? Leathery uh, yeah. wings? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and, and you know, the, the, the thing that's really important for people to understand is this, that the control of hidden information is the control of people. You know, Jesus said an amazing thing, you know, and and uh, he said, I, I, you know, I'm the good shepherd, and a good shepherd is not going to throw his sheep out there to be wolficated, okay? That wolficated is kind of like fornicated by the wolf. It's a new word I just made up, and I, I have meaning. I have meaning to those words, okay? I just got to be a little more guarded in how I describe them fully, though I understand what I mean by that. It just means you're going to be eaten up by the wolves. And, and, and the Bible spe- says specifically, forgive me, that God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Who? God's people. Okay, why? Because they reject the truth. You know, I complained to the Lord, and he gave me a wonderful, I, I guess you'd say, a spanking in love, because, you know, it used to bother me so much. And, and I can't lie and say it doesn't still bother me. But why is it that God's people are the most difficult to get through? And this is what the Lord told me, and it's good to remind people of this. And you can check history, and no one can prove this statement wrong. It may be Nineveh's exception, but that's not what the Lord said. He said, no word spoken by a man of God is ever received by the people of God at the time the man of God speaks it to the people of God. Do you remember me saying that years ago? It's true. Jesus made it simple. He said, which of the prophets did your fathers not kill? And and when we come back from the break, you know, this whole thing is critical about bloodlines. 
the Illuminati, the Luciferians, I mean, they take the bloodline serious. The entire human genome project was to define those that had, if you will, the, the, their father's blood, their father the devil. It's a question of blood. And it's a question even, you know, someone says, well, why when re- reading the Old Testament in Numbers, does God go into such detail of so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so? God literally spelled out the genealogical tree of the faithful so that there was no fallen angel hanky-panky in there. Isn't that cool? You know what you're going to say? I'm going to tell you I who your that. fathers are. If that's, and listen, I, I mean, this is one of those points where I'd actually do a backflip if I didn't think I'd break my neck and could get more than six inches off the ground. The bottom line is is that we're looking at an amazing love again for his creation. Let's not forget, there's no love in Islam. You know, it's, isn't it amazing that they always quote the Quran as, uh, you know, claiming Allah is merciful and all they're doing is beheading people and, and slicing people's throats, and that's all they're doing? Or I put up a website, or on my website tonight, a picture of a Saudis beating a woman who's tied by her feet to the ceiling in a rope, I put up the website of indiscriminate murders and beheadings, and they always say, you know, the merciful, hey, God is merciful. God loves the world. And the women's movement in the United States and worldwide that doesn't take up the cause of the slaughter of the innocent women worldwide, it's just one more uh, indictment against the hypocrisy and the lies that they've tried to perpetrate on the American female while so many uh, females are butchered. And you saw ISIS gave the degree, uh, what, three days ago for the uh, mutilation of uh, women's genitalia. It's one thing to scream about it four years ago and tell people it's coming. Now it's here, ladies and gentlemen, and make no bones about it. We are going to deal with that issue in this country. And i got to tell you, Doug, it, it, it's critical. It's the fallen angels and their hatred for mankind. By the way, in the next hour, Tim, you and I need to de- get into the fact that these guys aren't, uh, you know, all of them bound in chains or anything. Uh, I mean, you know, it may be truer than we think. They live, uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and aliens in the Pentagon might be a lot more true than any of us imagine. And, oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, do you know what the Pentagon openly calls the fallen angels? They call them the gods of the Sumerians who are returning. Go ahead, Doug. Well, uh, very good, Steve and, and Tim. Uh, folks, are our very special guest tonight, Steve Quayle, stevequayle.com, and Tim Alberino of Alberino Analysis. Uh, of course, there you can find it via stevequayle.com. Folks, you're listening to a very special Tuesday edition of the Hagman Hagman Report. We're going to be right back after these brief, this brief interlude. Stay with us. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our third and final hour of this Tuesday, July 29th, 2014 edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Our special guests are Steve Quayle, his website, stevequayle.com, joined by Timothy Alberino. It has been a fantastic first two hours, very informative. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Timothy on and, and always with Steve. I'm going to give it back to Steve, and, and you guys go ahead. Well, Doug, one of the things that is really critical is I think that people are going to have to be armed with the truth. And there are a lot of guys writing about a lot of stuff. And again, ladies and gentlemen, the book that I recommend for the pre-Adamic stuff is go to Tom Horn, Raiders News Update, uh, RaidersNewsUpdate.com, and order uh, Pember's Earth's Earliest Ages. Tom asked me, um, well, I don't know, four years ago, whenever, he said, Steve, what is the most important book to bring back that's been out of print, in your opinion? And we talked about a lot of stuff. I said, Tom, the single most important book that you can bring back that is so Jesus-centered that deals with this stuff is Pember's book. Now, I want to share something. Years ago, one of the first books I wrote, which is still remarkable to me how the Lord uses it to win people to Jesus. If you're really having a hard time with this, please may I suggest, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how many more of these I got. I, I tried to do a warehouse count every so often. But the book Aliens and Fallen Angels, The Sexual Corruption of the Human Race, lays out everything that you're hearing Tim and I talking about tonight, including the what do the, what, what do the aliens have to do with ancient architecture. And the Genesis 6 Giants book, which is kind of a, uh, you know, I guess you'd say a compendium of just literally hundreds and hundreds of giants, 
uh, settings and bones being found and everything. You know, it, it, the idea that a group of individuals would keep all this stuff hidden is dealt in my book, uh, True Legends. But I want to share this, people. Again, you hear V, you hear me, you hear Doug, you hear everybody, our guests, uh, the time we guess. No one knows the exact date. But I will tell you this, that you're going to need the information that's in Aliens and Fallen Angels. Because once you know, it takes away the basis of fear. And it's amazing to me how science fiction movies, Tim, have kept everybody in fear as they pretty much told them the truth. And, and just as a good example, a number of years ago, I, I, I was given a prophetic word. I gave it on the radio. I gave it a couple times, and I lost the thing, and I tear my hair out over that one. But the Lord said the invisible will become visible. The things that used to be, uh, be uh, fearful in the night will become fearful in the day. Everything that men's worst nightmares will walk the earth again. And it went on and on and on. And I said, Lord, man, this is really, this is really scary stuff. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and I passed it on in the prophecy, but you have nothing to fear. For when I said, I have given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Interesting, isn't it? Serpents and scorpions are the things mentioned in the book of Revelation. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But I will say this, what you don't know can kill you. It's not me. Don't get mad at me over this. But if you quote the word of God, and he says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Excuse me, he's not saying the heathen are. He's not saying the pagans are. He's not saying the profane are. He's saying his people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? Because we reject it. It's not that God doesn't bring it across our path. And that's why Jesus not saying that the the wise of this world will inherit eternal life, but he said the children of this world in their generation are more, are more wise than the children of light. Well, the point is, is that that's what we're trying to bring to light tonight, is that this stuff is coming fast and furious. And by the way, Doug, it's my contention, I've said this for I don't know, 20 years, people who have listened to me on the radio will know I said this, my contention is the reason they want to disarm us first and foremost they don't care so much about, you know, um, how do I say this? Well, they do care about resisting them. They don't want their little hot shots from another dimension getting blasted, okay? They don't want us to have any visible means of defense against, you know, whether you call them the invader from Mars or the invaders from under the Earth, you know, or the Mars attack. They just simply don't want anybody... And and that's why it is so fascinating. When I talk about giants, and Tim, I think I've told you this, you've heard this on the radio before, when I do coast to coast, I think it's, and, and because they told me the number, I'm not making this up, 46,000 federal computers go on to listen to that show. They log on. 46, everybody, every three-letter agency, every four-letter Defense Intelligence, National Reconnaissance Office, NSA, CIA, DIA, NRO, and it goes on and on and on and on, okay? So tell me this. What is it that I'm talking about that provokes them to have to listen? Well, what it is is, is that if you're in a secret brotherhood and you take oaths to basically have your tongue cut out, if you divulge the secrets of the brotherhood, or you're a member of the oldest, and what most people don't understand, actually one of the Sherlock Holmes movies with Robert Downey Jr. dealt with it, but you're dealing with an Egyptian uh, pharaonic lineage that dates back uh, even to the antediluvian age. There is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the earth, although that which has been hidden under the earth is ready to make itself known. So, Tim, at this point in, in tonight's, we just scratched the surface, but at this point, what are your, what are Timothy Alvarino, what, where are you at in what you're looking for next and what you see immediately coming upon the earth and how it plays into what we've talked about tonight? Well, I think obviously the big word is deception, deception. And there's something that um, that the Lord has really been impressioning on me, uh, especially the last six months, is um, I forget in, in the New Testament, in one of the epistles, Paul is writing to, uh, I mean, in one of the letters of Paul, he's writing to, I can't remember if it's the Galatians or if it's the Ephesians, I always get him confused, but basically, one of these groups of people, one of these churches, was they thought that the that that the uh, return of Jesus was so imminent 
that they didn't have to work or that, you know, they didn't have to go about their daily lives. There were, some of them weren't working, and that's, of course, the famous line where, where the writer tells them, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's why he told them, because, you know, they, they just basically checked out of life because Jesus was coming tomorrow, basically. And what did Paul, what did Paul instruct them? He, he, told it, uh, uh, he told them this, which I find very interesting. He told them that um, we know... That, I'm paraphrasing, of course. We know that before Jesus comes, two things he mentioned are going to happen. One, the great falling away, the great apostasy is coming. We know. You know, he's telling them this so that they, they, they cannot feel like it's coming tomorrow. He's saying, no, it's not coming tomorrow because two things have to happen. You should be looking for these two things. We as believers should be looking for these two things. The great apostasy or the great falling away, and that is referring to believers falling away from the faith in Jesus Christ, falling away from the true faith, the great apostasy. And the word great obviously indicates that it's not going to be just a handful. It's going to be multitudes of confessing Christians falling away from the faith, and maybe not necessarily just rejecting Jesus, but, but uh, basically receiving the doctrines of demons and watering down the gospel and divorcing themselves uh, from, the, from the primal doctrine of Jesus Christ, that, the, the, that he shed his blood on the cross to redeem us, you know, and that's the exclusive way to be redeemed to God is, is through the cross. And they're going to depart from that. That's the first thing he said. That is the, the, the first thing, the great falling away. And then he said, and that, that man of sin be revealed, speaking of the Antichrist. So he's telling this group, whether it was the Ephesians or the Galatians, uh, that, you know, he exhorts them in their zeal that for the Lord's coming, but he says, you know he's not going to come yet until these two things happen. The great apostasy, which I believe is directly, and I think it's obvious, is directly related to the great deception. So the great deception and the great apostasy, I think it's a sequential situation. You get the great deception, which then uh, catalyzes the great apostasy. And then the man of sin is revealed. Whether that happens at, uh, at the same time, or after, or before, I don't know. But those are the two things that we as believers ought, who, are, who are awaiting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are awaiting the King, we need to have our eyes and our ears open to looking for the great apostasy and the revealing of the man of sin. Now, the, 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 the great apostasy, the falling away, like I said, has to do with the deception. So I have been, you know, like I keep saying, I, I'm intimately uh, acquainted with deception. So, so I am. I, I have a, a let's just say, uh, you know, an extra set of eyes and ears when it comes to deception, because I've been so I intimately affected by it, and so I'm looking for the deception. I want to, like, like you said, Steve. I want to understand what the war is about, what's going on, what's the deception, and, and I think as believers. We ought to really be interested in that. That's not something that, that we can afford to set aside. And there's a lot of believers out there. Most people who call themselves Christians believe that we're in the last days. Uh, or I would say at least, let's say at least a, a very large portion of believers believe that we're in the last days. So on one hand, they will make the claim, we're in the last days, you know, and, and sometimes it'll be a very obvious thing. Yeah, of course, we're in the last days. Look at this, this, and this. But yet, at the same time, uh, through the other side of their mouth, they completely, you know, reject and, and renounce anything that has to do with being vigilant and understanding what's happening on the planet. Because we're looking for the deception, we're looking for the revealing of the man of sin, because we know when those things kick into gear, the coming of the Lord Jesus is imminent. And so the question that I have, and, and, and what's really provoking me, is are we beginning to see the, the first, uh, you know, the first shoots of that deception appear? I think that the answer to that question is yes. And so we have to be able to discern the times we're living in, understand the deception that's coming, and have the understanding that, that this deception isn't just going to be oh, there he is, look at the Antichrist, we're not following that guy. No, 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 the great apostasy. And that's one thing that, you know, a lot of these books and, and movies about the end times, they, they quaintly leave out the great apostasy. So there is going to be a massive falling away from the faith. And so what I'm saying 
and I feel like the Spirit of the Lord is saying, brace yourself. Brace yourself. And that means get rooted. Put, throw your roots down even deeper in the gospel. Understand the gospel. Get intimate with Jesus. Be connected to the Spirit of God. Brace yourself because a great apostasy is on the horizon. And, and I know that uh, uh, Steve and Tom just, just uh, uh, did a show the other day with, with Doug and Joe about the, the war you know, the, the war on Christians. And, you know, they're, they're, we're coming into a time, and we're already seeing it happen with the emergent church and these, uh, 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 these um, what do you call them, the, the, uh, uh, the huge churches, the massive churches. Mega, mega, mega churches. Yeah, yeah, mega, mega churches. churches. Yeah, they're preaching everything, aren't they? They're preaching everything, prosperity, health, love, joy, peace, everything except the core gospel of Jesus Christ. The core gospel of Jesus Christ. And, 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 you know, people say, people might wonder what I'm referring to exactly. Well, listen, listen to this. Peter and the disciples were with Jesus through, through, for, for a few years, or at least for a couple of years, going around with him, seeing the miracles he was doing, listening to him to preach all, listening to him preach all over the place, seeing the, witnessing the most amazing events. And Jesus, at, at some point in time, you know, in that, in, during that time, says, who do men say that I am? Let me tell you something. That is the question, okay? Who do men say that I am? That is the, the defining question that you, if you're a believer listening to this program, you have got to be able to answer that question correctly or else you will be swept away into the great deception. I promise you will be swept away into the apostasy that's coming. If you cannot answer the question who do men say that I am accurately and scripturally? Jesus said, who do men say that, that I am? Of course, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're the prophet. And, and, and then he said, but who do you say that I am? And, of course, Peter, inspired by God, he, he had the revelation of Jesus from God the Father, and he uttered the words, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And, and when we read that scripture, sometimes we just kind of think, well, duh, you've been with him all this time. He's been saying that he's the son of God. He's been calling God his father. You know, he's been doing all the miracles and all the signs. But he, Peter had to have the revelation from God as to who this man was. You are the son of, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And, and you know, that sounds like, well, of course, you know, yeah, that we all believe that, and, and, and many people listening to this broadcast absolutely do and have that revelation. But so many believers don't understand what that means. He's not a son of God. He's not a Messiah. He is the exclusive, only begotten son of the Father. And he is the exclusive fulfillment of the messianic prophecies concerning him all throughout Scripture. He is the one, the only one, who has the right to rule and reign over this planet from the seat of David. Only him, and there is no other. It's not about joy and peace and happiness. That's not the gospel. The gospel is he is the Son of God, the Messiah. He is our blessed hope. He is our redemption, and there is no other aside from him. And that is the rock of the gospel, and we have got to make sure that we are so firmly planted on that rock that no matter if, you know, uh, suddenly some of our major cities are suddenly overshadowed by UFOs or, or large alien craft, and these, and these beings are coming out, and they're, you know, Maybe they're glorious looking and they're, and they're full of, you know, grace and, and humility and, 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 and wisdom and, and this and that. You know, how do you judge? How do you test the spirit? How do you know, you know, what is of God and what is, what is not? It's the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who do men say that I am? I mean, and, you know, this is something that obviously was, this, this, is the, this is the New Testament. It's all about the Son of Man, the Messiah, who he is, who we are in him why he is who, we, who he is, why we are who we are. And it's such a fun, fundamental thing, obviously. This is, this is the, the, the most fundamental thing about Christianity, and yet this is the thing that is being the most profaned and ignored and rejected and overshadowed in, 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 in all of Christendom. 
So, so to, to, to answer your question, Steve, that's what is on my heart is, is, is believers have to understand that it's not, okay, Jesus is coming, so pretty soon at some point in time, because Jesus is coming, those of us who are believers, we're just going to have our clothes folded and we're going to disappear. You know, and our clothes are going to be sitting there all neatly folded in where we were. That's not the sequence of events. The great deception is coming. And we're not to be afraid of it, just like Steve just said. We don't have to be afraid of it. We have to have the uh, revelation of Jesus Christ. It's, it's abiding in the vine. It's understanding who he is, having full confidence in who he said he was, that gives us that safety and that confidence in the face of, I don't care what happens. I don't care who comes down. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. If they speak a word contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then they are from hell. They are demonic, and they are here to deceive us. And, uh, you know, that is the thing that's, that's pulsing on my heart, because I do believe that we are entering into the days of the great deception. And there's a lot of people out there who are preaching that we're in the last days. And so because we're in the last days, they're looking forward to a great harvest, or they're looking forward to a great revival. They're looking forward to a great move of God because, they believe we're in the last days. But, and as much as I respect their enthusiasm and their desire for a harvest and the desire for a move of God, I have to look at, at, at that logic and, and I, mean, I have to look at what they're saying and, and come to the conclusion that that's not really logical because what's coming is an apostasy. That's what precedes the coming of the Lord, among other things. Apostasy. And it's all over the New Testament in the book of Revelation. It's like, it, you know, I see it in bold letters apostasy, deception, and people always tell me, why does it matter? Well, who cares? What is the relevance of, of, of understanding, you know, the anti diluvian world? What's the relevance of knowing, you know, anything about, uh, you know, UFOs or the Nazis or aliens or anything like that? What's the relevance? Who cares, you know? And, and the, the simple answer is we're supposed to be lovers of truth, for one thing. We're supposed to be lovers of truth. We, we should be, in truth, the, the household of faith, the body of Christ, should be the most awake and aware group of people on the planet. Because the spirit of truth, the, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, he reveals all things. It doesn't just say churchy things. It doesn't just say religious things. It said he's coming and he will teach you all things. He is the spirit of truth. And he will give you the discernment and the revelation of the days in which you live so that you might be wise as a serpent the harmless as a dove. And that's, you know, so people say, well, who cares? What does it matter? And yet these same people who so often tell me, what does it really matter? Why should it doesn't really matter? We're just, you know, trusting in Jesus or whatever. We're just going to trust in Jesus that when that time comes, you know, we're, we, you know, we're, we're just going to believe that, that, uh, that, 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 you know, we're, we're in the fold and whatever. But at the same time, they'll, they, they'll go and they'll, they'll have all these stats about sports memorized. They'll know the names of all these football and baseball players, and, and they'll have all these they, – oh, just, just, they, they, they have amassed, many of these people, an enormous uh, quantity of, of, of uh, frivolous information. You know, so they're, they're, they're on one hand saying, oh, that stuff's not important, but on the other hand, they're filling their minds and their hearts and their understanding with frivolous distractions. And I'll even go further, not just frivolous distractions – uh, Luciferian programming, Luciferian programming. And so obviously those of us who start to, you know, break outside of the box and, and, and begin to delve into these deep things, uh, there's an automatic reaction because of the Luciferian programming to, to turn against us, to not believe what we're saying, to reject what we're saying immediately, automatically. And that's just, that, that's just the nature of the situation in, in which we're in. People... Uh, they want to have communion with the truth. They want to have. They want to receive the blessings. They want to receive the fruits of being a believer. But they don't want to live vigilant on the earth. They want to float through life. They want to just you know go through their happy, uh, you know, comfortable life. The goal of so many people's lives is just to be as comfortable as they possibly can. Not only comfortable physically, but comfortable in their pers in their uh, paradigm, in their perspectives. It's, they, they love that, uh, that, that, that quintessential comfort. I call it quintessential Christianity. 
that, that feeling, that fluffy, nice feeling of being able to say, I'm a Christian, and therefore I'm this, that, and the other. But without being vigilant, without searching the scriptures, without searching out what's happening on the earth so that you are not deceived and constantly grounding yourself in the word. You know, uh, um, the Bible says, uh, um, um, woe to the man who thinks he stands lest he fall, or um, um, however it says that. But basically, you know, we have to be always rechecking ourselves, making sure that we're not being sucked into the lies that are just absolutely permeating society. And, man, you cannot get away from it. You have to be aggressively vigilant to not be affected by the Luciferian program. And this is something that, uh, um, and if this is something that's, it's, it's active. It's, it's, it's something that you have to be working towards, rejecting the propaganda, rejecting the programming, always returning to, always listening, being alive and awakened to the Spirit of God. And one thing that, um, that I've, uh, that, that I realized some time ago, and it was really an eye-opener for me, and Steve alluded to it, is that understand that the world in which we live is not governed by kings. They want us to think that, go- that kings, royal sovereigns, govern the earth. Listen, the world is governed and always has been, on the human, in, the, in the, the human component of it, by priests. Priests first, and then kings. Priests and kings, doesn't that sound familiar? That's what the Lord makes us. That's what we are in Jesus. He makes us priests and kings. Well, that's what the devil makes his followers too. The hierarchy is they're priests and kings, but they're priests first. And what does that mean? Does it mean that you've got just a bunch of old guys uh, wearing funny-looking robes, uh, doing these goofy seances and rituals and, you know, stabbing goats or whatever? No. We're talking about a faction of people that have what Pembers calls intercourse with demons. And when I say intercourse with demons, I'm not just referring to uh, that they're, they believe in demons or, you know, like I said, they're doing these rituals. No, they are in communication with demonic entities, including fallen angels. They're getting their orders from them. Understand that they're not, the, the faction ruling the earth, the briefly faction ruling the earth, is not confused about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They know what it is, and they reject it. They reject it. And we are enemy number one to them because we are the ones who have authority in the name and power of Jesus Christ. So these guys are, these guys are you know, are sacrificing babies and three-year-olds and drinking blood and having orgies with demons. And this is and, and as gross an offense as, as that may sound. That is the world in which you live, the world in which you were born into. This is the priesthood that is governing our planet, and they are in, they, they are having intercourse with these ent- entities, and this is, again, this isn't anything new under the sun. This goes back to the beginning. This goes back to the fallen angels in the Genesis 6 of the, and their offspring. This goes all the way back, and we've been taught to view uh, paganism and the worship of idols. I, when I was growing up, I always thought, why in the world did all these idiots worship stones and trees and, and carved figures? Were they that stupid? The answer is no. They were not just simply worshiping a stone or a rock or, 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 or a totem pole. They were worshiping the power, the, listen to me, the manifest power behind these idols. The manifest power behind these idols was active. And uh, if I may, I'd like to read an um, a, uh, excerpt here from, um, from Earth's Earliest Ages. It's in Chapter 14 uh, under the chapter of theosophy, on theosophy, it says the ancient religions were able to satisfy, now listen, this is very important, the ancient religions were able to satisfy the cravings of intellect. For many centuries, the true nature of, of the early systems of religion was unsuspected by Christians. It has been usual to regard paganism as a mere brutal worship of sticks and stones, as a gross superstition so utterly devoid of intellectuality that when once expelled, it could never return again and deceive an enlightened and educated world. It was carelessly assumed to have sprung from ignorance and mental incapacity, whereas its wonderful power of adapting, whereas its wonderful power of adapting itself to the carnal mind should rather have suggested an emanation from those powers of the air which affected the ruin of our first parents, and to suppose that anything which comes from such a source 
need be wanting in intellectual vigor and beauty would be a folly as great as that which represents the fallen son of the morning under the guise of a horned monster. And then he says, there is little chance of escaping his snares unless we recognize the fact that the resources of intellect are yet at the command of himself, referring to the devil, and his host, that still, quote, there is some soul of greatness in things evil. And I find that to be a profound statement by George Pember living in the late 19th century, because he was living in a time when he didn't have the Internet, he didn't have all of this explosion of technology. They weren't really talking about transhumanism yet. There weren't even automobiles, and, and at least not to the likes of which we have now. There were no airplanes or anything like that. And yet Pember was astute enough to recognize and to warn the people that understand that the, that the deception that's coming is being fabricated, is being manipulated, is being controlled by entities who are vastly more intelligent than we have been led to think, vastly more organized than we have been led to think, and vastly more driven towards our destruction than we've been led to think. Now, that's not to say that, oh, they're so great and we should worship them. No, it does tell you why the ancients worship them. But no, because we serve a king who is vastly, unfathomably greater than these entities. And in fact, he comes back at the end, and when all of these entities and human beings are gathered to make war with God, as he looks down and laughs at them, Jesus returns and he strikes them down with the sword of his mouth. So I'm not worshiping these entities or, or elevating them to an unfit level. No, they're vastly intelligent, but they're vastly less more intelligent and wonderful and powerful than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, hey, if, I know, can, that I, if I can jump in here, uh, you know, folks, and, and Steve and, and Tim, uh, God bless you. And, and by the way, uh, uh, Pember does go on to say that the present revival of their doctrines and practices, which were originally communicated by the Nephilim, or um, and, and Nephilim. But look at what we're seeing on television with the uh, Beyonce and these other people who are openly uh, um, uh, worshiping demonic entities and, and goats and having sex with, demon, uh, with demons and such. Isn't this what we're seeing today? It, 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 isn't the television um, it, uh, being used a, a, as a device to, uh, to do exactly what was done before? Um, are, are we not seeing a revival of what you just, what you just spoke about? Absolutely. Yeah, telepresence. You know, yep. here's the deal. When it comes to, you know, television, obviously Marshall McLuhan made the statement, it's lost on 99% of the people because they don't understand it. He said the medium is the message, okay? And obviously, you know, in telepresence and telescreen in Orwell's world, it was the way that, that the uh, not-so-benevolent rulers usurped everyone's thought processes and inserted themselves into their lives. The thing is, Doug, uh, I think I, I've quoted it before on your show, but I think it was Gehring, the head of the Luftwaffe, uh, said, it's a good thing for us, people don't think. And, and see, this is, the, this is unfortunately, uh, this is not like uh, Dante's Inferno, where abandoned intelligence, all ye who enter here, we're told to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And this is what what is is coming out of Timothy Alberino's. Uh, you know, obviously he's, he's younger uh, than I am, but the thing is, is the Lord's given Tim a massive download of understanding in this stuff. All I can tell you is he's a never-ending sponge for as much water and moisture of the truth of the Word of God as he can get, because he has. You know, this is something that's interesting: the passion for truth is gone from 99% of the people in America. Someone says, you can't say that. Oh, yes, I can. No, let's just take one thing, for instance. Human flesh is that which entities from hell feast on. We have seen cannibalism in Syria. We have seen the most debauched, disgraceful, disgusting beheadings, throat slittings. And, and I don't know if you saw it, Doug and Joe and, and Tim, but one of the YouTube videos that I put up on ISIS was basically, I think it was, I don't know, what, 20 Nigerian pastors in white robes, and they were just laying down on the side of the dish, and the guy would slice their throat and then just kick their body into the ditch. 
it looked to me like it would have been better at any point to put up a fight, okay? It looks to me like at any point it would have been better to be armed and at least take a few of the devils with them. But you see, the thing is, is that, that, I mean, unfortunately, it used to bug me, Doug, and I said this on your show, that, Lord, why did you have to make a sheep? And because sheep aren't the most, you know, uh, noble creature in the in the pasture, and then, Lord, why did you basically make this statement, we're all sheep uh, led to the slaughter? And he gave me a wonderful answer. He said, the sheep that stay close to the shepherd don't have to worry about being slaughtered. Do you remember me saying that, Doug? Uh, yeah, I, I, I do, and, and I know what, uh, what video you're talking about, and, and my mind, uh, my head almost exploded watching that. I I'm, I'm, was thinking the same thing you were, you were uh, just referencing. Well, right, and and then I, you know, and then the Lord says, "Go to Daniel. They that know their God shall be strong and do exploits." And then, you know, obviously we're, we're praying for Greg Evanson. Let me personally thank each and every one of you that's volunteered a kidney for Greg. Uh, they're going to find out all the medical requirements, and you know, if we need to, we'll we'll do what is necessary to take up the uh, cost. We're trying to find out what the insurance company will cover because major, you know, uh, organ transplants are horrifically expensive. But, Doug, 12 people came through for instantly. Um, God bless Manette. Uh, She posted, by the way, if you guys want to read one of the most lovely alerts ever penned that will make you burst out in tears of joy and laughter and praise to God, go to my uh, website and read. uh, And I'm not not lifting her up. She just happens to be an intercessor who loves Jesus. And read it. I've never gotten so much response in my life from an alert like that. And basically, it's just what happens when we start to care for people? What happens when we make a difference? What happens when we go to the Lord and say, Lord, let me touch somebody's life for you today? Look, tonight we're talking about fallen angels. We're talking about all this stuff. But there's a world going to hell. There's a world need that that drunk or that, that, and I want the homeless people taken off the streets before they get whacked, you know. When we were told by Special Operations Command, Hawk and I were, uh, forgive me on time, but five or six years ago, that there was an orchestrated assassination program going on for the homeless, and their bodies were being incinerated well en route in basically the highest tech uh, incubatoriums ever, ever designed or ever made, you know, they called them smoky trucks. You know, people laughed, they scorned, they scoffed until they noticed that there's no no um, homeless in a lot of areas where they used to be homeless. Or how about the states now that are making it illegal to be homeless? Or the poor veteran that was charged and given a fine who was broke for sleeping in his car. You know, the point is, is that this this passion for hellishness, okay, this representation earth of every foul and unclean thing is absolutely the portals of hell have been opened up. The gates of hell are opened up. Uh, venomous, vile, wicked, disgusting, vomitous creatures, entities, and forces are coming out. And it's because the salt lost its savor. And yet now we've got total lawlessness in the land. And by the way, the Bible talks about the Antichrist being a man of iniquity. And the mystery of iniquity, that just means lawlessness. And you read the dumbass, and forgive me, I mean this with full full fury in my voice, dumbass Republicans trying to figure out should they or shouldn't they impeach the president, and they're going along with all, everything behind the scenes. You've got World War III being manufactured. I think this is relevant, because remember this, Jesus said, if he didn't shorten the days for the elect's sake, Even the elect would be destroyed and be deceived, okay? Remember, deception, the ultimate fruit of deception is destruction. The ultimate uh, uh, point of, of God revealing his word, his son, his Holy Spirit, and his power in our lives is resurrection. It's, it's relationship. It's not religion. And, and let's look at the world. You know, I come on your show and talk about Zechariah chapter 12. Henry Gruber talks about Zechariah 12. And I, I remember, Doug, the, the, the well-meaning, ignorant uh, people that told me that will never happen. America will never turn about against Israel. Now, I'm talking about Israel. I'm not talking about the, who's a Jew and who isn't a Jew. Who's a Magyar? Who's a Khazar? Who's a true Semitic uh, person? I'm talking about the whole world is is using an unjust measure and and the man who was raised 
under one of the most rabid hate Israel guys, does, does a leopard change its spots? Well, here's the fact. I'm surprised. I'm totally surprised. It took, uh, it took where it's taking us to get to the point of seeing that the whole world now is gathered. That's the biggest prophetic time marker. And what's happening from what I hear of the Native Americans I talk to, of, of what I hear from the uh, military guys I talk to, or whatever, you know what, to a man, to a woman, they're saying that they've never seen so much supernatural evil activity in their lives. My answer to them all is the same. You bet you haven't. You ain't seen nothing yet. The point is is that when I have women emailing me and they're being raped, R-A-P-E-D, by entities, that makes me furious. That's when, you know, you've got to get a hold of somebody like John Kyle, or I'll pray for him too, or anybody with authority can pray. And, and you know, it's amazing to me. And ladies and gentlemen, let me share this with you. The servant is worthy of the hire. Those of you that aren't going to, to uh, uh, churches or have fellowship on Hagman and Hagman, I'm serious about this statement. You need to support Doug and Joe, and if you're calling John Kyle for ministry, support him. These guys labor in love. I can't tell you how many hours John ministers to people, and I'm his friend. So I'm going to speak up, just like I speak up, Doug, when you and Joe are pouring your hearts out and you can't pay your bills that month. I'm not asking for anything. I'm asking for people to simply care. And when I see the amount of emails, and I'm only talking about the people who can afford to, I'm not asking. One lady sent me a 10-cent check uh, the other day. I think she meant to send me $10. That's what she said. So I'll send her the 10 bucks and tell her to keep the 10 cents. I'm not kidding when I say that. The point is, is that we're, we're at now a time period unlike any other. There's no wisdom any of you or I or any of us possess that can outthink the devil. There is nothing in me that knows more than a fallen angel. The only thing I know more than a fallen angel knows, I know that Jesus is my Lord. I know he's my Savior. I know I've blown it. He never has. I know God has given me the better end of the deal than I've given to him. Still, his mercies are new every morning. And so what I'm saying to the people who can, somebody sent me a snotty email. I'm not even gonna, and somebody said, well, quit spending time on your detract. No, you need to hear this. And, and they were putting themselves above, basically saying, I thank God I don't have any of those issues. Well, wait until you do, brother. Wait until you do, sister. Not a threat, just a real a reality check. Because what's coming down, remember what Pastor Langford said? God bless David. He said, you don't need to go looking for trouble. It's coming looking for you. And it's one thing when they're in blue helmets and when they're, you know, uh, spetsnaz or, or Chinese intelligence. That's one thing. It's a whole other world when basically the entities come from hell. What's fascinating to me, Doug, and we're getting to the end of the show, is you cannot separate, and this is what's interesting to me, and I guess after 43 years of writing about this stuff, I got something to say about it. But in my 43 years of study, I still am flabbergasted at those who will yield to evil. That will appease evil, whether human sacrifice or, or self-flagellation, bloodletting, you know, whatever they do. Yet they simply will say no to Jesus. There will come a time, you mark my words, with the biggest war, and there are Catholics who listen to me that know I'm telling the truth, between, I would say, traditional Catholics and the New Age uh, you know, uh, uh, final Pope crowd that basically you will be told either accept these space brethren or you will be killed because you can't go into the new world entity or do you think the aliens want any Christians around going we know who you are, you know or when they say do you see me as they possess someone or destroy someone and you say I see you come out in Jesus name you know, that's, that's what, this is the thing I wish I could get across to the Christians tonight, Tim. This is the thing I pray I can get across to everyone who's got ears to hear. This is a supernatural battle unlike any other in history. There have been supernatural battles in history, but Jesus said there's never been nor will be after anything like that's coming upon the earth. Does that make me afraid? It makes me to the point of going, Lord, only you can get me through this. That's why I pray every day, by the way. Lord, help me get it through. And if I wake up and go, oh, darn it, or say something even worse than that, I'll say, Lord, 
I yield my mouth to you. I yield my tongue to you. Show me how to make a difference in somebody's life today. I can guarantee you, Doug, one prayer that God will answer so clearly for everybody tonight. If tonight or early in the morning when they pray tonight or as they pray tonight and go to bed or early in the morning when they get up, if they ask the Lord to bring someone across their path who they can be a blessing to, it is the delight heart of a loving God that will more than be happy to basically let you be a blessing to someone else. By this shall all men know that you're mine. What? By you cutting off everybody's heads? By you disemboweling children? By you vaginally mutilating and, and doing all sorts of gross things to women? By hanging them from their feet because your, your uh, tradition says it's okay to beat slaves? By whipping, by, by doing, and I'm not going to go into horrible things, but doing every horrible thing? That's not the love of God, yet that's what the world's embracing. Because when the churches don't speak up against it, I think, Doug, the strongest word that the Lord ever gave me, and I gave it on your show, was the fact that God said, Steve, tell my people, if they do not speak up and stand against it, it will overtake them, and they will be giving account to me for why they did nothing, said nothing. And, and somebody wrote me an email, Doug, saying, well, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. No, Paul is very clear. Uh, uh, James is very clear, especially in the book of James. Show me your works, and I'll believe you have faith. But don't tell me you got faith. Like those people that tell me they just trust God. I say, do you go to a dentist when you get a cavity? Yes. Do you go to a doctor when you needed your baby delivered or you needed your appendix taken out? Yes. Um, well, why didn't you just trust God? And they come back with an incredible statement. We don't trust God for that stuff. So you're telling me you don't trust God for that stuff, but somehow in the worst time in history, given the worst set of circumstances, you're going to somehow trust God? It's phony faith. It's religion talking, and it has no uh, foundation to reality. Go ahead, Tim. I'll let you close it out. We're, you know, 14 minutes left. Um, I wanted to uh, clarify that uh, it, it's Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3, for those who are interested in looking at that scripture. Let no one deceive you by any means, but that they will not come unless the falling away come first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Um, I wanted to read a, uh, one more excerpt from, from Pember's book um, that uh, this was something I read through and I thought, wow, this is so profound. Again, this guy was writing in the in the late... Uh, 19th century, and he writes, the seven, the seven causes of antediluvian corruption, are they all present in operation, he asks. Um, he says, the seven great causes of the antediluvian apostasy have been already noticed and may be summed up as follows. One, a tendency to worship God as Elohim, that is, merely as the creator and benefactor and not as Jehovah, the covenant God of mercy dealing with transgressors who are appointed to destruction and finding a ransom for them. Two, an undue prominence of the female sex and a disregard of the primal law of marriage. Three, a rapid progress in the mechanical arts and the consequent invention of many devices whereby the hardships of the curse were mitigated and life was rendered more easy and indulgent. Also a proficiency in the fine arts which captivated the minds of men and helped to induce an entire oblivion of God. Four, an alliance between the nominal church and the world, which speedily resulted in a complete amalgamation. Five, a vast increase of population. Six, the rejection of the preaching of Enoch, whose warnings thus became a savor of death unto the world and hardened men beyond recovery. And seven, the appearance upon the earth of beings from the principality of the air and their unlawful intercourse with the human race. How astute was that? Of uh, How astute was George Pember writing that way back then? And, I mean, I, I can't think of seven things that, that, that more accurately uh, displays the times in which we are currently living. They were just beginning in his days, and now we see them on full display. Uh, you know, even as Doug was re referencing, you turn on your television, and these are the things that are on display in front of your face. Um, and the seventh, the final thing, the appearance of uh, upon the earth of beings from the principality of the air and their unlawful intercourse with the human race is just beginning to be activated. So, 
again, I want to reiterate, uh, if you haven't read Earth's Earliest Ages, go to Tom Horn's website and get it. Because, you know, Steve often refers to stuff that, that's been time-locked by the Lord. I think, you know, this has got to be one of the most important books that is, uh, I'm so thankful that uh, Steve and Tom uh, uh, were inspired to get it back into print. And th- this is this is the the hour in which we live. Whether people believe it or not, whether they like it or not, these are the days in which we live. And um, uh, I don't know, uh, Doug and Joe, if you wanna, if you guys wanna chime in here at the end. Well, I just want to say thank you, uh, thank you both. By the way, this is so important as we see on television. The um, uh, and, and folks, this is why we have people uh, that come on and talk about the signs, the symbology. Uh, about the Olympics, about the Super Bowl halftime games, the, about the secret handshakes and the codes, the winks, the nods. These are the people, the, 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 these very things that uh, our guests are talking about tonight are the very things being uh, relayed by these uh, ceremonial, magical, t- mystical type of, uh, of, of, of displays that include, but are not limited to what's on the television with the uh, sickening uh, type of uh, uh, demonic uh, uh, Luciferian uh, uh, ongoings, okay, with uh, events and, and and folks, you know, it's interesting. The very same people who go to church uh, or who go to a service come back. They watch this as well as the vampire flicks, the the gross um, the things that that are are, are just unbelievable. But uh, please know this. Folks, and then I'm just going to turn it to uh, to Steve. But please know this: that uh, the organized religion that we see today are trying to uh, really hold back any inquiries, as if seeking the truth was not or is not of God or not necessary for our salvation. And I got to tell you, uh, it's the other way around. We need to be as wise as as possible. It, it, and and we need to do that through the word of God, understanding history and understanding the playbook of the enemy. Steve? Well, we're we're at the point, Doug, where everything's going to come together at once, okay? You know, it, thank God that uh, that the Lord has told us these things. He said, let not your heart be troubled. There's so much to trouble our hearts, but this is why... The, I, somebody said, what, how, how do you get into the presence of God? I said, simple, fall on your face, and I literally mean that. Kneel beside your bed, kneel beside your chair, whatever. Do change your posture and begin to ask, for those of you that don't know him, him to reveal himself to you, the honest heart. Nobody who's honest will he turn away from. I've got guys that are loaded, meaning they're either stoned or drunk. You know, saying, oh, I tried, it didn't work. I said, were you high? Well, yeah. Well, I said, well, then let me pray for you to bring you down, and then let's try it again. But I think that what we're primarily talking to tonight are Christians. I want to share something. This is critical. Doug, I am I, I'm more convinced than ever that the Christians with the answers will be used by God to redeem their brethren. And what I mean by brethren, people who are going to come late into the game and late to the cross and will be the ones getting into the heaven at the very last time. And I don't know where we're at in time, but I'm just saying is this. But you've got to be armed. And again, the thing is is that I don't believe in one uh, single iota that the Lord had me write, Aliens of Fallen Angels, the sexual corruption of the human race. I believe he gave me the titles. Genesis 6, Giants, Master Builders of uh, of uh, the Prehistoric, uh, the, whatever the subtitle is. I can't even think of it right now because I'm trying to do 100 miles an hour. But the point that I'm trying to make in all this is simply this, that you've got to be armed. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I, I am the only guy, I say this, and then people say, well, I see copies. Well, if they're on uh, Amazon, they're pirated copies, or somebody's just trying to sell one they already bought. But I'm the only guy that has them. I went out to my warehouse and I said, Lord, how long will I have to to continue to get these books out? And I just had kind of a sinking feeling in my stomach. I have, by the way, a pallet and a half of Genesis 6 Giants. They take so long to print, and that's about four or 500 of them. I looked at Xenogenesis. I've got another about 1,000 of Xenogenesis is where we're at. 
uh, Genesis 6 is how we got here. And Aliens and Fallen Angels tells you that it takes in everything. It takes in Aliens, the Fallen Angels, and the, um, oh, good night, Giants. And, but just a cursory, just barely touching on it. Once people have a systematic understanding of evil and they understand the root of evil, you don't have to deal with the fruit. Until you curse the root, until you get to the root of the matter, you're only going to be dismayed, befuddled, bewildered, and tossed to and fro if you're dealing with the fruit of evil. Long ago did the Lord give me the understanding on the fig tree, and I, get, I share, you know, freely I've received, freely I give. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, it looked good. And everybody said nothing happened, but because he cursed the root, it had withered up and died. Until we get to the root of evil and begin to attack the root of evil, all the fruit will just basically branch out and do intervention, and it will cost humans their lives. So, ladies and gentlemen, Aliens and Fallen Angels, seriously, is probably one of the most important books I've ever written. By the grace of God, the Lord has used it to win a lot of people to himself. Genesis 6 Giants will talk to you about everything, Tim, and you should go on my website so you can get a feel for Tim Alberino. He'll be doing shows with Doug in the future, just he and Doug. He's more than capable, and as you can see, he certainly uh, uh, doesn't lack enthusiasm or anointing. And then the third book is Xenogenesis. Xenogenesis is now worldwide. I can't tell you how pastors and some of the most... Uh, um, literally, I mean, places I didn't even know existed are using it to teach the people of God. But I find the people of God all over the world, as relayed to me through their pastors, have a hunger for the truth. And so what a privilege it is to be able to share the truth. What a privilege it is to be able to bless the people who listen to the Hagman and Hagman Review and to praise God for those who are being set free, those who are being uh, uh, given information that they can stand on. Because here's the deal, Doug. My prayer has always been that those who have a heart for Jesus, that the Lord would literally surround them with his presence, that he'll deliver your listeners. I mean that seriously. You've heard me pray it so many times, so I don't think I'd pray it unless it was something on my heart, that God would literally have every one of our listeners, ours, Tim's, yours, you know, whenever you're on, David Langford's, those of us who are on this show, that basically everyone would be at the right place at the right time, never the wrong place at the wrong time, and that God would literally make them invisible to all evil that comes against them. I pray for the blood of Jesus. I thank God for your program, Doug. And again, ladies and gentlemen, you can go on my website. You know, the books are the books are basically a tool to help you fight the days that you must fight. And when you know what's going on, you know what's coming against you. Tim, God bless you. Thank you so much for sharing tonight. And and you know, Joe, blessings and greetings in the name of the Lord. Good night, Doug. Good night, Tim. Good night, Joe. Good night, Steve. You God Good bless night. you. Good night, Tim. God bless you too. It's been a fantastic show. Tomorrow night we'll be joined live by uh, with or with Hawk uh, for the whole show. Uh, so join in or tune in tomorrow at 8 p.m. Uh, for the Hagman and Hagman Report with Hawk. Have a good night, everyone.